Today, I'll be recapping seasons 1 through 4 of the 2014 action, horror, and comedy series called Z Nation. Make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any fresh updates. In 2017, the ZN1 zombie virus has taken over the Earth and is being referred to as a catastrophic event leading to extinction. Mark Hammond, our hero, rushes to rescue the last doctor who is working on developing a vaccine for zombie infection, just as new orders arrive instructing everyone to evacuate to California. Simon, an NSA geek, assists in arranging transportation by helicopter to Mark's location. Upon reaching the doctor's office, Mark discovers three prisoners undergoing the process of being infected with a variation of the zombie vaccine. The first two attempts fail, resulting in their deaths. However, there is hope that the last prisoner may respond positively. Amidst the chaos of a zombie attack, Mark evacuates the doctor and safely boards her onto the chopper. He then returns to retrieve the final prisoner. Meanwhile, Simon gets left behind at the Northern Lights zombie attack station as the plane on the runway departs without him, ultimately crashing moments after takeoff. Fast forward to 2018, a year later, in upstate New York, where we join the funeral of Nana. In this future plagued by zombie attacks, funerals are prearranged events during which individuals are mercifully shot in the head. On this occasion, Roberta takes on the responsibility of carrying out the task. However, she receives a call indicating that someone is near the river. Charles Garnett, another survivor, accompanies her, and together they wait for the boat carrying the men to arrive at the shore. To their surprise, the passengers turn out to be familiar faces, Mark and Murphy, the latter identified as humanity's last and best chance for survival. Mark mentions that he learned about the camp from a former police officer at a nearby prison. Meanwhile, at the Northern Light Station, Simon engages in conversation with his timid girlfriend, who turns out to be a pre-apocalypse recording. A call comes in, revealing that the government needs to locate Mark and Murphy, and the operation known as Bite Mark has failed. Back with Roberta and Charles, they decide to assist Mark and Murphy in reaching the Tappan Zee Bridge. Enter Addie, Mac, and other survivors seeking ammunition advice from a vendor specializing in such items. Addie settles on an aluminum bat equipped with spikes, while Doc trades for aspirin. They encounter a group of zombie brothers and successfully eliminate them before continuing their journey. However, an impressive development takes place, the zombies appear to be organized. They launch an assault on the camp, having concealed themselves as corpses in the river. This raises concerns for Roberta and Charles, who contact the camp. In response, Mark shows them Murphy's bite marks. Through the radio, Doc reveals that the camp, called Blue Sky, has been overrun by zombies. Addie, Mac, and Doc flee for their lives, while Mark, Roberta, Charles, and Murphy return to save them. Now, the entire team is on the run. The team arrives at a rendezvous station located outside a high school only to discover that it has also been overrun by zombies. They hear the cries of a baby inside, and to their surprise, the baby appears to be unaffected by the virus. They also rescue Cassandra, who has been hiding from zombies in a cage for two days. She informs the team that the school was initially overrun by survivors, followed by a zombie attack. The team decides to transport the baby to the next outpost and scavenge for supplies. They notice someone observing them through a sniper's rifle, but the identity remains unknown. Nevertheless, this mysterious individual saves Doc's life from the rooftop. Suddenly, a horde of zombies attacks, and shockingly, the baby becomes infected. Mark ventures in to find and eliminate the baby, while the rest of the team contemplates leaving him behind for good. In his attempt to confront the zombie baby and its mother, Mark becomes the target of their ferocious attack, resulting in his gruesome demise. The team is forced to shoot Mark, the mother, and the baby zombie, showing them mercy in their dire state. As they gather in the high school parking lot, they contemplate their next move. It is at this moment that Simon interrupts with an important update. He has made contact and has learned about Hammond's death. Simon inquires about the safety of the package. With Charles now in charge, Simon provides a comprehensive briefing on Operation Bite Mark, which involves transporting Murphy alive to California. Charles decides that they are fully committed to the mission and makes a stop to recruit 10K, the skilled sharpshooter who previously saved Doc's life. Finally, Simon establishes a radio station, assuming the identity of Citizen Z, and in a significant development, Murphy loses a tooth. Citizen Z initiates his attempt to establish contact with the CDC's Mount Wilson station, but encounters a zombie attack on the station. In order to rescue them, he must remotely disable their mainframe, although this action will result in the deletion of all data files, including the vaccine information. Observing the zombies breaching the facility, he executes the command, inadvertently erasing Murphy's file as the Mount Wilson command center crumbles. Meanwhile, the team finds themselves stranded by the roadside due to a vehicle running out of gas. Additionally, they need to remove a zombie stuck under a tire. As two motorcycle riders pass by, Cassandra conceals her face. Citizen Z realizes that someone is approaching the Northern Light listening station, but it remains uncertain whether they are humans or zombies. Consequently, he arms himself. Meanwhile, the team makes a stop at a shopping mall in search of gas and supplies. 
During their stay, they encounter Travis, one of the bikers they previously encountered on the road, who suggests a possible gas source at a refinery in New Jersey. Heading towards the refinery, the team realizes it resembles more of a zombie factory. Though the purpose of what lies inside is unclear, the zombies show a strong interest in it. Detecting the scent of gasoline, they decide to explore the place and potentially acquire a tanker. Cassandra, drawing from past experience, knows that zombies are attracted to high-pitched sounds, such as the music box she wears as a necklace. As Cassandra and Travis ascend the staircase, he implores her to come home. Hattie and Mac follow closely behind, dispatching zombies along the way. When they encounter a malfunctioning machine at the top of the refinery, they discover that the zombies are falling into a pool of oil. Meanwhile, the zombies are also drawn to Cassandra's music box. While Roberta and Charles fill up the tanker truck, Murphy and Doc engage in card games and share their backstories. Murphy fabricates a story, claiming he volunteered for the zombie virus trial. On the rooftop of the gas station, Cassandra and Travis engage in a heated argument about her refusal to return home, leading Travis to ask what happens when I tell them what you are. Back at the listening station up north, Citizen Z engages in a cat and mouse game with two dogs. The well-behaved dog appears as frightened of the zombie dog as Citizen Z himself, resulting in a frantic chase with his gun in hand. At the refinery, zombies swarm the area as Doc fights them off. Sharpshooter Ten K picks off zombies, but Murphy drives off in the suburban before Doc can rejoin them. As the zombies close in, Charles instructs Roberta and the others to escape while he stays behind to save Murphy. Meanwhile, Travis holds Cassandra hostage at the building's rooftop, insisting that it's time for her to return home. Cassandra retaliates by kicking him off the structure, and the zombies converge on his body below. Citizen Z eventually manages to eliminate the zombie dog. After Murphy crashes the truck, a fire erupts, igniting the fuel truck along with the desired fuel they saw. With their mission in ruins, the team departs from the refinery as the zombies succumb to the flames. 10K secures a couple of gas cans, Addy reclaims her bat and Citizen Z locates them thanks to the explosion. He establishes contact through a payphone using the NSAS listening grid and advises the team to continue heading west until they reach the ocean. As the team ventures onward to their next adventure, two bikers arrive at the refinery and recognize the now zombified Travis. They show him mercy, presumably hot on the trail of Cassandra. In a flashback, we are given a glimpse into Cassandra's past. She used to be part of the Philadelphia Cannibal Survivor Group, luring men into trailers with promises of sex only to rob them and use them as a food source for the group's cannibalistic activity. Presently, Cassandra travels with Roberta and Charles to Philadelphia. They come across a truck with the Liberty Bell attached to its back and encounter a zombie when they open the door to steal it. After 10K swiftly eliminates the threat, they take possession of the truck and drive off with the Liberty Bell. However, their path is diverted when the truck swerves to avoid an incoming zombie attack, causing the bell to fall and kill several zombies. Zombies. Strangely, nobody utters the phrase give me liberty or give me death. At Northern Light, Simon prepares steak for his newfound canine companion, mentioning the abundant food supply available, including various cuts of steak. Meanwhile, in Upper Darby, Pa, the Philly cannibals gather around a table for another gruesome meal. One of their members returns and informs their leader, Tobias, about Cassandra's whereabouts. On the other hand, our brave team of zombie hunters finishes the remaining food they've found, mostly Twinkie. They decide to split up to search for food and an antenna dish that Addy can use to contact citizens. Addy and Mac discover a police cruiser with a functioning radio and end up killing a zombie cop and his detainee. Doc, 10K, and Cassandra secure a satellite dish while engaging in a conversation about pornography. Cassandra runs off when she realizes that her family has found her. Taking advantage of this, they decide to kidnap Addie, hoping that the group will be willing to make a trade. Simon manages to connect to the police radio in time to hear Addie being abducted. He relays this information to Mac when he returns, preventing him from thinking that Addie has been bitten. Mac grabs Addie's camera and hastily retreats as more zombies approach. Tobias assures Addie not to fear and plays an eerie tune on a small organ, offering her meat of unknown origin. Addie declines, expressing disinterest in joining their group. Subsequently, the other two girls take her away to get new clothes. The team confronts Cassandra after realizing that Travis from the refinery was involved in her abduction, implicating her as well. Under pressure, she confesses about Tobias, the leader of the family, describing them as even worse than zombies. They are cannibals. They do not consume dead people as their bodies are infected with the zombie virus. Instead, they capture living individuals and slowly mutilate their flesh. The group decides to rescue Addie while the family indulges in their gruesome meal at the Upper Darby compound. As Addie faces an impossible choice, the rest of her group arrives and Charles confronts Tobias, signaling 10 Kelvin to eliminate family member Burn. Eventually, Cassandra steps forward and offers herself as a prisoner swap for Addie, returning to the truck. The team gathers to discuss their next steps and whether they should go back to rescue Cassandra. They contact Citizen Z through the police radio and request him to play music that attracts zombie. They put their plan into action, with Doc pretending to be a client seeking an intimate encounter with an exotic girl. As Cassandra enters the trailer with him, he instructs her to follow his lead. With the team approaching and music blaring, the diversion works. 
Cassandra and Doc manage to kill one of the guards, and she incapacitates Tobias by tasering him in the mouth. The group, riding westward, storms into the upper Darby compound amidst a horde of zombies. Rescuing Cassandra and Doc, Tobias attempts to hide haphazardly in the room where the food supply is kept, but the compound is overrun by zombies. They apprehend Tobias and seal his somewhat ironic fate. The team escapes Philadelphia unscathed, listening to the music Citizen Z is playing for them. Addie and Cassandra appear to have formed a close bond through their shared experience, which seems to worry Mac to some extent. Murphy's entourage, hailed as the saviors of humanity, find themselves in Pennsylvania Dutch country, taking down some Amish zombies. They discuss the possible spread of the Z-virus, speculating that birds might be carriers. 10K shares a personal revelation about having to eliminate his own father, whom he now refers to as it after his father turned into a zombie. Their journey takes a tense turn when they are pursued by a group of humans in a punch buck. Shortly after, they encounter a group of zombies who are actually disguised humans. It's an ingenious yet unnecessarily complex scheme. The humans pretending to be zombies brand guns and demand the truck. They drive off with it, leaving the team with the VW buck. Citizen Z provides updates on the deceased and introduces the team members, revealing his affection for Addy. As the team approaches the culprits who stole their truck, they discover a family attempting to rob them of the vehicle. Everyone seems to want a piece of that truck. When they find the family dead, the team realizes they urgently need to get off this road. In the listening station up north, Citizen Z maintains hope as he finally receives communication from the zombie team via a drive through camera. Citizen Z positively identifies Murphy, and the team in inquires about alternative modes of transportation. Citizen Z informs them about a possible helicopter location. The team sets off for the emergency headquarters for infection control. Everyone at the headquarters is deceased except for a sentry who insults them, referring to them as raggedy ass. When they claim to possess crucial information about the Z virus, he demands drugs. The sentry confiscates all the Oxycontin that Doc has and escorts them to the general. Surprisingly, the general has lost his sanity. Charles seizes this opportunity and convinces the general that the doctor can provide assistance. When Doc enters, he discovers that the general is fatally bitten. Being an honest person, Doc informs the general of his impending demise. In response, the general throws him down an air shaft. However, Doc miraculously survives, getting entangled in cables alongside a trapped zombie. Back at the listening center, Addie and Citizen Z engage in a flirtatious chat on Facebook. It turns out Citizen Z has been using Addie's Facebook page to converse with himself, posing as her. Meanwhile, at the EHIC, the team hears Doc screams from the airshaft and enters the building accompanied by the guard's warning of future regret. On the other hand, Doc chooses to indulge in a high with the zombie. In a flashback, 10K agrees to grant mercy to his dying father, whose time is running out. Returning to the present, 10K dispatches another zombie. In the elevator shaft, Doc and the zombie are both intoxicated, and Doc unexpectedly reveals that he has a child somewhere in the world, a surprising revelation. Meanwhile, in the general's office, it becomes evident that he has completely lost his sanity. He uses a satellite phone to call in airstrikes while berating the President of the United States. Murphy experiences a panic attack in the elevator and rushes out, leaving the team unable to stop him before the doors close. Upon reaching the next floor, they disembark in search of Murphy. In the meantime, Cassandra, Addie, and Jake encounter and eliminate a threatening zombie. In the air shaft, Doc discovers a sharp object and dispatches the zombie he was stoned with. Although Murphy hears Doc's cries, he cowardly refrains from assisting him. The team battles numerous zombies, depleting their ammunition in the process, and reunites just in time to face a colossal, seemingly indestructible zombie. Max shoots it in the head, and they engage in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, repeatedly striking its head to no avail. Amidst the struggle, Garnet, grappling with the zombie, pulls the pin on a grenade attached to it, and Addy shoves it down the air shaft. Everyone mourns the loss of Doc but quickly regains their focus on finding the helicopter. They encounter the general, who initially threatens them with a bazooka. To their relief, it turns out to be unloaded. The general surprisingly agrees to assist them, as unpredictability is a common trait among crazy individuals in positions of power. Unfortunately, the helicopter is in ruins, lacking rotors and significantly damaged. The general admits his probable insanity, and two zombies attack. The general draws two pistols and eliminates both zombies as they all plummet off the roof to their demise. The team heads back to the truck. The sight of a zombie dock approaching them shocks everyone, and Roberta volunteers to grant him mercy. Fortunately, she misses, and it is revealed that Doc is still alive. He appears zombie-like due to the recent explosion. At the listening station, Citizen Z continues his imaginary conversation with Addie, playing another song for her. Embarrassed, Addie overhears him. Finally, in a flashback to 10K's childhood, we witness him finally killing his father, underscoring the harsh reality of living in the world of Z Nation. The team takes a break at an abandoned country house. While Mac and Addie sneak upstairs for some action in a real bed, Roberta and Charles explore the yard and take down all the rushing Zs that approach the electrified fence surrounding the property. Roberta reveals that they're near her hometown, but she has no interest in visiting the past. 
she's haunted by memories of her husband, Antoine, whose current status is unknown. However, a violent flashback incapacitates Addy, interrupting their lovemaking. With the storm brewing and zombies attacking through the electric fence, the team makes a swift exit. Up at the listening station, a pretty drunk Citizen Z reprograms a weather satellite and advises the team to find shelter as the storm moves across the country. The team debates their options but is ultimately forced to head to Castle Point, Roberta's hometown. Once there, Roberta finds a photo of Antoine, her husband, seeking refuge. They end up at Roberta's old house, where they discover a young woman caring for her seriously wounded husband. Roberta questions their presence, and the woman mentions that a fireman told them it would be a safe place. Roberta asks the young woman if Antoine is the fireman who brought them there, but her concern for her wounded husband prevents her from confirming. Zombies approach the house as the wind intensifies. In the upstairs bathroom, Murphy realizes his deteriorating condition, with his skin worsening, hair falling out, and teeth decaying, signs of a potential full zombie transformation. At the fire station, Roberta and Charles find supplies, and Roberta regrets not waiting to see her husband before leaving Castle Point. Unexpectedly, zombie firemen attack the fire station. Roberta and Charles kill one of them, initially thinking it might be Antoine, but they discover it's actually his best friend, Dearborn. In the basement of Roberta's old house, the group seeks refuge. Addie continues to experience her random nightmare flashbacks while Mac and Doc attempt a crude medical procedure on the wounded husband's head. When the drill breaks, they resort to using Mac's gun as a hammer. Despite the blood, Doc assures them it's a positive sign. At the fire station, Roberta holds a funeral for the fallen firemen. She and Charlie venture out to confront the remaining zombies but are surprised to find none. As they drive back to Roberta's house, they face a tornado, possibly even a zombie nado. Meanwhile, Murphy develops empathy towards zombies and tries to understand them better. Roberta comes across her wedding album and decides to stay in the living room, waiting for Antoine instead of joining the others in the basement. While the rest of the team takes shelter at Roberta's house, Cassandra and 10K find refuge in an abandoned car. The tornado tosses the vehicle around, and 10K notices Cassandra holding onto his knee, sparking a romantic connection amidst the chaos. The car flips over, but they both survive the storm. During the tornado's havoc at Roberta's house, Murphy embraces a zombie for protection while someone in a fireman outfit shields Roberta from the storm. When Roberta regains consciousness, she miraculously survives the devastation, but her mysterious savior is nowhere to be found. As the storm subsides and the team prepares to continue their journey west, Murphy's anxiety escalates, Doc sacrifices some morphine for the young married couple, and Charlie fulfills his lifelong dream of honking a fire truck horn. As they leave town, a lone zombie fireman roams through a field, the embodiment of Roberta's husband, Antoine. Citizen Z contemplates the various origins of zombies, whether it's from comet dust, a genuine biblical apocalypse, or something else entirely. In a small Missouri town, members of an enigmatic church transform their philosophy into action, considering the zombie apocalypse as the second coming of God. The Zs are even referred to and somewhat revered as the resurrected. Meanwhile, Murphy relieves himself in a field while the team discusses the possibility of his eventual transformation into a full-fledged zombie. The silver lining is that they're close to Provincetown, a renowned safe haven. However, upon arrival, they are asked to surrender their weapons at the entrance, indicating that things might not go as planned. Additionally, the three youngsters seen at the Erie Church earlier request re-entry to the compound, a decision Major Williams, Charlie's former military colleague, allows. But is it the right choice? During a guided tour, Major Williams informs the team that the compound is devoid of weapons and supposedly zombie-proof. He provides some background on the peculiar church, revealing that the three individuals granted re-entry were followers of the head preacher, Jacob. Jacob firmly believes that the zombie apocalypse fulfills the promise of eternal life. Meanwhile, Charlie and Roberta finally consummate their undeniable chemistry in a private room. As this unfolds, Jacob and his followers approach the compound. While inside, the three devotees commit suicide with their cross-shaped blades and transform in disease. So much for being zombie-proof. Roberta and Charlie hastily dress when they hear the zombies attacking. Armed with books as makeshift weapons, they investigate the overrun compound, kill a zombie that breaks through the door and find an escape route through the emergency exit. In the meantime, Murphy encounters a frightened woman in the bathroom, but when they are attacked by Zs, the creatures pay him no mind as they mercilessly kill the unfortunate woman. Everyone rushes toward the emergency exit, but they are met with a horde of Zs closing in. Addie experiences a paralyzing vision during her panic, but Max snaps her back to reality. Suddenly, 10K heroically bursts open the emergency exit door allowing Cassandra to escape with him while the rest of the team is captured by Jacob. The deranged preacher presents them with a choice, join his living flock or become zombies. As 10K covertly enters the compound and retrieves a gun, and Cassandra makes a dash for the truck, Murphy boldly declares himself the zombie messiah. To prove his claim, he fearlessly puts his fingers into a zombie's mouth without getting bitten. Unsatisfied with this proof, Jacob draws a gun, 
intending to reveal the truth through a bullet to the heart. Murphy's life is saved when Charlie valiantly takes the bullet for him. Roberta and Charlie, as he lies dying, confess their love for each other, and he urges her to go on without him. Roberta considers granting him a merciful death, but time is of the essence as the team plans their escape. Once they reach a safe distance from the compound, Roberta uses a long-range rifle with a sniper scope to deliver a merciful end to Charlie, now transformed into a zombie. In Kansas, everyone remains in a state of mourning for the loss of Charles Garnet, which undoubtedly came as a major shock. A grief-stricken Roberta gazes longingly out the window while Citizen Z delivers a heartfelt eulogy. When the truck experiences radiator trouble, Addie and Mac decide to scout ahead on their motorcycle. After a temporary repair, 10K volunteers to take the wheel. 10K, Murphy, and Doc occupy the front seats while Cassandra sits in the back. 10K accelerates rapidly, prompting Doc to question his driving skills. In response, 10K tells Doc that he learned on his own. Cassandra, appearing concerned, fastens her seatbelt, and Doc advises 10K to keep his hands at 10 and 2 on the wheel and be gentle with the gas pedal. Meanwhile, Mac contemplates the possibility of leaving the group, but Addie reminds him that abandoning their friends and mission would be selfish. Mac eventually agrees to stay. But unfortunately, they end up taking a different path than the rest of the gang at a fork in the road, leading to the team's separation. With 10K behind the wheel, the truck arrives at a location that can only be described as a gun and liquor filled carnival. Doc encounters an old acquaintance resembling the antagonist from Pete's Dragon named Sketchy McLean. Sketchy claims that there are no zombies within a hundred mile radius. But Mac and Addie have just witnessed an invading horde of zombies, indicating that things won't go smoothly. Nevertheless, the team decides to stick around since they need a new truck and Roberta feels the urge to drown her sorrows. They opt to participate in a shooting contest, only to discover that 10K has a formidable competitor, a skilled young woman named Brittany, who proves to be just as proficient with a rifle. Inside the bar, Doc encounters a shady character named Foreman, who boasts about his apocalypse-proof mega-vehicle. Murphy, choosing not to negotiate, takes matters into his own hands by ambushing the vehicle's owner while he relieves himself against the barn wall. However, things take an unexpected turn when Murphy briefly exhibits zombie-like behavior and actually bites the intoxicated man. Meanwhile, Roberta gets heavily intoxicated and forms a bond with the bartender, while the shooting contest commences and 10K finds himself smitten with Brittany. The wounded and furious foreman re-enters the bar, revealing that he has been bitten by Murphy. Up north at the listening station, Citizen Z realizes that a dust storm, which turns out to be a roving horde of zombies, is approaching western Kansas. In the tense atmosphere of western Kansas, even without the stampeding zombies, the rowdy bar patrons catch up with Murphy. A display of stylish gunplay results in the creation of four new zombies, all dispatched swiftly. When Doc confronts Murphy about biting the man, Murphy tries to persuade him that he didn't do it. Murphy flees, stumbles upon the lifeless body of Foreman, who, surprisingly, hasn't turned into a zombie, retrieves his tooth from the wound, and places it back in his own mouth. Truly hardcore. Meanwhile, with the zombie horde closing in, Roberta reflects on Charlie's death, engaging in an intense moment of searching for a reason to live with the zombie bartender before ultimately killing him. 10K and his potential love interest, Brittany, tie in the shooting contest just as the zombie horde begins its relentless invasion. In a pivotal moment, 10K emerges as the victor when he delivers mercy to the ice cream truck driver, the lure for the shooting contest zombie targets. As he and Brittany flee, she runs out of ammunition. But he comes to her father's rescue by shooting a pursuing zombie in the head. In a gesture of gratitude, Brittany receives the giant gun he has just won and plants a kiss on his cheek. Meanwhile, Roberta adopts the persona of an Old West gunslinger and single-handedly eliminates numerous zombies. As the team prepares to depart from the gun and liquor spectacle, 10K faces an attack from a zombie, only to be saved by Brittany and her new gun. Could there be a budding romance between sharpshooters? However, Mac and Addie have no time for love as they witnessing an approaching horde of zombies, aptly referred to as a tsunami. Citizen Z finds himself in a state of boredom, and his well-being may be deteriorating. Shortly after an alarm in the listening station goes off, his vision momentarily blurs, and he looks up to witness a fireball hurtling towards Earth from outer space. Unbelievable, right? Yes, a Russian spaceship has landed right in the backyard of the station. Meanwhile, things are taking a turn for the worse in a small Nebraska town. The team faces difficulties in locating water, and they're on the brink of dehydration when the zombie horde begins to close in. Eventually, they manage to reach shelter and are joined by new survivors. At the listening station, Citizen Z encounters the pilot of the Russian spacecraft, Yuri, a seemingly amiable cosmonaut. The newfound pals share some Earl Grey tea while Yuri recounts the hardships he faced on his space station and his escape on an escape pod. They raise a toast to their survival, but questions linger, where are the other cosmonauts from the space station? 
And why is Citizen Z's dog still in slumber? Back in Nebraska, Murphy attempts to rally the team as one of the new survivors reveals that the zombie horde is migrating from Canada due to their aversion to the cold. Most of the zombies were once part of a survivor's colony in Alberta, all turning within a week. It's a tragic situation up there. Murphy ponders if the zombies have an actual leader as the team hears a scratching noise emanating from the morgue. Doc and 10K dispatch a zombie, prompting the team to seek refuge inside the body lockers. Up north, the new comrades indulge in some heavy drinking, play games, and develop a rapidly evolving bromance. It's a heartwarming bond until Yuri mistakenly addresses his new friend as Simon instead of Citizen Z. Wait a minute. How does Yuri know his real name? In Nebraska, everyone manages to enter the body storage units, but by the time Roberta secures the last one, it's already occupied by a zombie. As Roberta allows Murphy to seal her inside a body bag, she emphasizes the importance of his return, as getting him to California is of utmost significance. Up north, Citizen Z grows increasingly suspicious of his newfound companion. Is Uri truly who he claims to be? Could he be a ghost? A space zombie? Things take an even stranger and more perilous turn when Citizen Z exits the bathroom only to find Yuri wearing his space station suit. A fierce altercation ensues, culminating in Yuri being tied to a chair. Yuri persistently questions Citizen Z about what's wrong with his dog, prompting a realization that something indeed seems off about the dog. Convinced that Yuri has poisoned both him and the dog, Citizen Z struggles to unravel the truth, despite his splitting headache. However, the tables turn as Yuri now has Citizen Z tied to the chair, repeatedly demanding, what do you know? Meanwhile, in Nebraska, one of the new individuals loses control, emerges from hiding in the morgue, and sacrifices themselves to the approaching zombie horde. Murphy encounters a family seeking refuge from the horde, but instead of aiding them, he steals their provisions, allowing the husband, father, now turned into a zombie, to enter the house and feast upon them. The zombie messiah can be a cruel one indeed. Back up north, Yuri questions Citizen Z about what sets today apart, while Citizen Z remains convinced that both he and his dog have been poisoned. Just as Yuri begins choking Citizen Z, the truth unveils itself, Yuri was merely a hallucination triggered by Citizen Z's declining mental state caused by the lack of oxygen in the station. The same reason behind the unidentified alarm in the initial scene. Citizen Z drags his unconscious dog towards the main doors, where the revitalizing cool air breathes new life into them. Farewell to the so-called new friend. Back in Nebraska, as the horde heads towards the next town, Murphy returns to the morgue with the food and water, employing his zombie messiah powers to divert a zombie's attention away from Roberta, who is hiding inside a body bag. The team gathers for a family meal on a table typically reserved for the deceased, while Murphy realizes that his transformation may be progressing even faster than anticipated. Mac and Addy. Now we witness their efforts to catch up with the rest of the team, some tension lingers between them, and it's undoubtedly connected to those eerie flashbacks that have been haunting Addy. Finally, she decides to confide in Mac, an image of a dark place, a menacing Z, and a guy who bears a suspicious resemblance to Mac. Could these be glimpses into the future? Mac tries to ease the tension by sharing his fantasy date with Addy. But the mood is shattered when she declares that they would never work as a couple. Mac counters by highlighting how they've kept each other alive. They come to realize that they've never actually been on a proper date, and as Mac sets off to rectify that, Addie drifts off into slumber. Suddenly, Mac awakens to the sound of Addie's screams. He rushes to her aid and discovers a snake, some zombie bodies, and a terrifying Z with Addie's whack-a-mole baseball bat launched in him. Just as a collapsing wall crushes Mac and he becomes zombie fodder, he wakes up. It was all a dream, but hold on. Is Addy now genuinely gone? Mac rises and relives the dream he's already had, encountering the snake, the zombie bodies, and the hulking zombie dude with Addy's baseball bat stuck in him and her necklace in his mouth. This time, however, Mac traps the big Z under the falling wall, only to perish and wake up again. And then it repeats. Mac finds himself trapped in an endless loop of recurring dreams, each one plunging him further into his existential nightmare as he learns from the mistakes and missteps of the previous one. It turns out that the colossal zombie is attempting to prevent Mac from reaching a door in a warehouse, but that's also part of the dream. When Mac awakens, he shares this madness with Addy. Upon hearing a zombie, they chase after it with the intention to kill, but instead stumble upon the door from the dream. Addy takes it upon herself to investigate. Behind the door lies another wall, and as they strive to break it down, the zombie attacks, ripping Addy's necklace off. Mac dispatches the zombie and tends to Addy. However, the zombie reappears. Mac wakes up. Again, in this next dream iteration, Mac re-enters the warehouse and ventures through the door himself, descending into a basement where he discovers a wounded young boy and slays a monstrous zombie emerging from the shadows. He is awakened by Addy, who informs him that he was having a nightmare and shouting, Why won't you die? Mac inquires about the origin of her necklace. Then Addy wakes up. It's a dream within a dream within a dream. And it keeps on going. In the final dream sequence, Addy strikes the imposing zombie, proceeds through the door, descends into the basement, and encounters the wounded young boy lying on the floor. She is subsequently attacked by a woman in a bathroom. 
who turns out to be Addie's mother. Thus, the revelation emerges that Addie had to take the life of her own mother. That's why we traverse these dreams within dreams, to delve into and release Addie's haunting memory and dreadful secret. Addie and Mac once again go missing on the road. Citizen Z finds himself bored while playing with balls, and in South Dakota's Black Hills, the team encounters zombie Mount Rushmore and an industrial pipe factory where glow-in-the-dark zombies are drawn to fart noises. The team crosses paths with Wilbur Grady and his daughter Amelia, agreeing to assist them in shutting down the nearby unstable nuclear reactor. They engage in a zombie killing spree, successfully get Wilbur into a miraculously functional elevator, and make their escape. However, Wilbur returns from the plant, having failed to shut down the reactor. He succumbs, turns into a zombie, and is mercifully dispatched by Roberta. With the reactor still posing a threat, Amelia discloses that their only hope lies with a peculiar individual named Homer, who's hiding out in the woods. Upon reaching Homer's eccentric survivalist dwelling, they discover that Wilbur's attempt to deactivate the reactor involved cutting a rope, causing the attached nuclear rods to plunge into the cooling pond. Homer offers his assistance and bonds with Ten K, as it appears that everyone wants to be a father figure to the young lad. Together, Homer and Ten K venture into the reactor, where they uncover an obstruction preventing the rods from descending. They employ a remote-controlled wheeled robot called Robbie to resolve the issue, but things go terribly wrong when the zombies seize control of the robot. Outside the nuclear reactor, Roberta maintains order while Homer expresses his need for help to personally rectify the situation inside. They also require fuel for the airplane to evacuate Murphy from the blast zone in case things go kaboom. Fortunately, Homer possesses an abundance of vodka at his residence. Hey, maybe that stuff can make a plane fly, right? Murphy and Amelia devise a plan to fly to Wyoming where rumors circulate about other surviving humans. Roberta loads Murphy onto the plane, stocks it with booze, and sends them off. But their flight is short-lived as the aircraft crash lands, resulting in Amelia's demise and subsequent transformation into a zombie. Upon reaching the reactor, the team splits up, 10K and Homer venture in, while Doc and Cassandra join Roberta outside. During a zombie attack, Homer's suit is compromised, leaving him exposed to radiation. No longer concerned for his own well-being, he decides to approach the radioactive pool even closer with 10K's assistance, employing a mission, impossible-style maneuver as he descends towards the liquid via a rope. Meanwhile, Murphy emerges from the plane wreckage, staggering through the woods, closely followed by the undead Amelia. As always, Murphy exhibits a peculiar ability to communicate with the zombies, but with Amelia, he displays a previously unseen compassion and tenderness. Is the zombie messiah becoming soft? Homer and 10K successfully shut down the reactor, after which Homer instructs his young companion to end his radioactive existence. However, 10K cannot bring himself to shoot Homer, prompting the old man to make it easier by plunging into the pool and turning into a zombie. A heartbroken 10K finally grants him mercy. As 10K emerges from the reactor, he understandably feels distraught. Doc offers him solace, and Roberta arrives in a golf cart filled with vodka. Shortly thereafter, Murphy emerges from the woods, trailed by Amelia. Murphy prevents them from ending Amelia's suffering suggesting that perhaps it's time for a different kind of mercy. They drive off into the sunset, leaving Amelia to wander the woods alone. Addie and Mac find themselves underground with Citizen Z, who is reuniting them with Roberta, Doc, Murphy, and the rest of the team. It turns out they're at an old CIA black site where Citizen Z directs them through a video conference to the supplies down the hall in a cool new ride. Continuing their journey, the team encounters Sam, a young boy on foot, who offers to get them food if they drive him to Salt Lake City. They arrive at a heavily guarded gate, where armed women welcome them. Helen, the leader of the Sisters of Mercy, a sanctuary exclusively for women and children, permits the team to gather food and medicine for Cassandra's infected leg. However, the men must remain outside the compound. Inside the sanctuary, a stunning natural preserve, Addie and Helen develop a mother-daughter bond. Addie finally releases her bottled-up emotions about her brother and zombie mother. However, the sanctuary harbors a dark secret. When male children turn 13, they are forced to leave and embark on a journey to Salt Lake City where they are unknowingly sent to their deaths. Although Helen would never harm the children herself, she perpetuates the false belief that their fathers reside in Salt Lake City. Furthermore, the boys are deceived about the city's true condition. According to Roberta, it's infested with zombies, making survival unlikely. Thus, if the boys perish during their journey, Helen and the others evade blame. It becomes apparent that Helen is a cult leader who selected Addie because she was vulnerable. Helen shares her own tale of being a sister-wife to an abusive husband though the veracity of her story remains uncertain. Her group enforces their own brand of justice, including locking up troublemaking men in a barn with a zombie bear. Helen enlists Addie's aid in rescuing two captive women from a biker gang, and Roberta accompanies them out of concern. When they confront the bikers on the road, Helen manipulates Addie, urging her to kill one of the bikers who then transforms into a zombie. Roberta finds this vigilante justice overwhelming and yearns to return to the road to California. However, Addie has made her decision, she chooses to stay and join the flock. 
Mac is devastated when Addie reveals her choice and pursues her as she flees back to the compound gate. Meanwhile, a sister of Mercy who seduced Murphy with blueberry pie becomes a prisoner of a surviving biker from the ambush, seeking revenge. He confronts Helen but is swiftly dispatched when Mac shoots him in the head. As Roberta and Cassandra depart the compound, Addie tries to bid a final farewell to Mac. When Mac refuses to leave her behind, Helen shoots him. Addie hesitates but does nothing to prevent the others from shooting at Mac and her friends. The team drives away, leaving Mac to his fate. Gunshots echo in the distance, hinting that Mac may have been gunned down as he approached the gates. Meanwhile, the sexy blonde sister of Mercy, who shared more than just blueberry pie with Murphy, may be pregnant. The young girl in the compound seemingly takes Addie's locket, either by stealing or being given it and young Sam resumes his solitary journey to Salt Lake City. As the team continues their westward drive, they encounter a roadblock near a golf course. In typical fashion, they face a zombie attack and skillfully eliminate many of them using golf equipment. During this encounter, they meet Janice and brothers Henry and Brett Zimmerman, who prove to be valuable allies in killing zombies. Murphy, as always, remains immune to zombie aggression. While Janice offers water to Murphy, Henry and Brett discuss the usefulness of Murphy's abilities as the zombie messiah. The team enjoys some drinks at the clubhouse, unaware that their new acquaintances have drugged them. The Zimmerman trio takes off with Murphy as their captive, leaving the team perplexed about their true destination other than California. After regaining consciousness at the clubhouse, the team finds themselves chained to a zombie, whom they dispatch quickly with a golf umbrella. Using a golf tee as an improvised lockpick, they free themselves and contact Citizen Z for assistance. Thanks to Murphy's clever act of looking into a traffic camera during a bathroom break, Citizen Z locates him. Murphy's captors desire his assistance in raiding a pharmaceutical company, as drugs hold more value than money in the zombie apocalypse. Reluctantly, Murphy agrees to help, though he takes advantage of a moment when his captors aren't watching to spit into one of their canteens. Soon after, Murphy discovers a new power as the zombie messiah. His saliva gives him partial control over Janice's mind when she unknowingly consumes it. Murphy also finds ways to share his bodily fluids with Henry and Brett by cutting Henry's hand and biting Brett. Now, Murphy holds some degree of control or at least some influence. At the pharmaceutical plant, Janice recognizes her ex-husband Jason, now part of the hyperactive horde of undead, and blames Brett for his death during a previous raid. Meanwhile, the team, in pursuit of Murphy, witnesses the effects of zombies consuming Viagra. Doc remarks to 10K that they have now seen everything. Brett outlines a complicated infiltration plan to Murphy, who embarks on a mission through the infested building in search of a massive supply of Oxycontin. He distracts the zombies by triggering an alarm and discovers a computer, enabling him to communicate with Citizen Z, who has been tracking down Dr. Murch, the enigmatic scientist responsible for turning Murphy into the Messiah. Murphy deactivates the alarm, causing the zombies to resume their rampage just as Roberta and the team arrive for the rescue. In the chaotic zombie onslaught, Janice falls victim to her husband Jason, Henry is brutally attacked by multiple zombies, and Brett holds Murphy at gunpoint. However, Murphy employs his newfound mind control ability, compelling his captor to turn the gun on himself. Roberta and the team are stunned by Murphy's newly revealed power as they set off on their journey to California in one of the pharmacy vans. Before the zombie apocalypse struck, New York City was still recovering from the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. During that time, a peculiar bald doctor roamed the streets, targeting drug addicts, administering mysterious injections, and stealing brain tissue. The identity and motives of this individual remain a mystery. Fast forward to the present, the team's destination has shifted from California to Fort Collins, Colorado, where they plan to meet Dr. Murch, the female doctor responsible for experimenting on Murphy in the past. The zombie messiah's behavior has become increasingly strange, and Cassandra's condition appears to be deteriorating rapidly. While en route to Fort Collins, the team engages in discussions about their future plans. Doc dreams of acquiring a boat, Roberta contemplates settling down in California, and 10K still has thousands of zombies left to eliminate. Upon arrival, as a precautionary measure, Roberta handcuffs Murphy, who then valiantly fights off hordes of attacking zombies to lead the team to the entrance. After a suspenseful moment, Murphy guides them through the sea of undead and into the laboratory. Meanwhile, in a flashback to the past, the bald doctor appears at an Ebola quarantine camp, seemingly continuing his brain tissue theft from an Ebola patient. Curious, isn't it? In the present timeline, as the team infiltrates the lab in search of Dr. Murch, 10K and Doc dispatch a few zombies. However, their efforts only yield old computer files suggesting that scientists were already researching a vaccine before the zombie outbreak occurred. Further inside the facility, the team undergoes a decontamination process that requires them to strip down, only to discover the horrific results of inhumane experiments that took place there. To make matters worse, they encounter a new breed of mutant zombies, powerful, deformed, and wholly unimpressed by the zombie messiah. Murphy, in turn, displays sudden and brutal strength as he effortlessly rips off their heads with his bare hands. Murphy, what's gotten into you buddy? 
continuing their exploration of the facility. Cassandra's weakened state necessitates finding her a safe spot to rest, possibly facing her impending demise. When Murphy is alone with her, supposedly saying his goodbyes, Cassandra becomes incredibly uneasy. What exactly transpired between them remains unknown as the scene cuts away. Shortly after, the team encounters a partially melted mutated individual in front of a computer who shows them a video revealing that Dr. Murch was responsible for his condition. Subsequently, they encounter the bald doctor from the flashbacks, Dr. Kurtz, who claims to be here to offer assistance. Citizen Z, equipped with top-notch facial recognition software, uncovers the true identity of Dr. Kurtz. He is actually Dr. Walter Kirian, the quack responsible for initiating the entire zombie apocalypse. Citizen Z instructs the team to eliminate the doctor, triggering a gunfight. In the midst of the chaos, Cassandra bursts into the scene, appearing to be a half-zombie. Additionally, Doc gets shot, Murphy manages to escape, and that's when the real trouble begins. It turns out that if an infected individual leaves the facility, a nuclear bomb is launched, targeting the premises. Once the nuclear bomb is launched, it sets off a chain reaction, with other missiles heading towards various locations worldwide, including the Northern Listening Station. Nobody is safe. Not even Citizen Z, who watches in a mixture of sadness, anger, and awe as the bomb hurtles toward him. The second season begins with Doc, Roberta, and 10K take cover in a tunnel to avoid the fallout as the nuclear weapons are activated. While Citizen Z deals with the Northern Light Post being overrun by zombies, he subdues them and sends an emergency broadcast. He urges everyone to be on the lookout for Murphy and announces that the CDC will provide cures and generous rewards for safely delivering Murphy. Mac arrives on his ATV and witnesses Addie killing the last reanimated member of the Sisters of Mercy. Addie explains that Sam, the child banished from the camp on his 13th birthday, returned, burned down the camp, and unleashed the zombie bear. The two of them set off to investigate. They decide to inform the others that they're alive, but accidentally hijack a radio transmission. It becomes apparent that the entire world is now searching for Murphy and offering a reward for his capture and transport to the CDC lab. Suddenly, Addie picks up a peculiar numeral code on her ham radio, which repeats excessively. In the meantime, Murphy sheds his decaying skin, revealing a shiny silver appearance. He leads a group of zombies who scavenge clothing from a thrift store. However, he encounters a survivor who intends to claim the bounty on him. Their plan goes awry when Cassandra emerges and impales the survivor. Cassandra appears to be a hybrid of a zombie and a human, much like Murphy. Meanwhile, Roberta becomes increasingly overwhelmed as she ventures out alone in search of help for 10K and the injured doc. Just before succumbing to starvation, thirst, or exposure, she hears the cries of a young girl being attacked by a horde of zombies. Roberta rescues the girl and is taken in by her family. They provide her with water and supplies, and she reunites with Doc, 10K, Mac, and Addie. The group journeys to Cheyenne. Wyoming, where they discover Murphy operating a zombie strip club. Roberta demands that he accompany them to California, but Murphy presents them with zombified strippers. Chaos ensues when a bounty hunter named Vasquez arrives to apprehend Murphy, leading to Murphy and Cassandra's escape. Ultimately, Roberta and the gang make a firm decision to locate Murphy and transport him to California, while Citizen Z embarks on a quest to find assistance. Serena, a member of the Sisters of Mercy who had a sexual encounter with Murphy, roams the countryside with her baby, searching for him. In the midst of the team's ongoing efforts to extract Murphy from Cheyenne and transport him to the CDC, a swarm of bounty hunters descends upon the area. Among them is a hefty guy in a black suit armed with a bazooka. While others are focused on capturing Murphy for the reward, this particular individual doesn't seem too concerned about taking his life. Cassandra, clad in a bathing suit and a fur coat, has begun attacking people similar to how the zombies do. Mac and Addie have yet to reconcile and reunite. However, things take a turn for the worse for 10K. The guy with the bazooka takes a shot at him, causing 10K to fall and hit his head. He briefly heads towards the light but returns, albeit deaf, which greatly affects Doc, who treats him like a son. The two of them venture off together in search of Murphy, who has used his ability to communicate with zombies to convince one of similar size and appearance to exchange clothes and act as a decoy. When Vasquez locates the decoy, he falls victim to an attack by Cassandra. As Doc strives to protect 10K, he crosses paths with a sniper and finds himself being choked nearly to death in a hotel room. Just as Doc's spirit hovers above his body, on the brink of slipping away, he spots a weapon and employs it to eliminate the assailant who was strangling him. Up in the North Pole, Citizen Z is pursued by a group of zombie soldiers. Despite a flashback from his past flashing before his eyes, Citizen Z manages to pull through. Vasquez comes to Roberta's rescue, saving her from a particularly vicious bounty hunter. However, not before she experiences a glimpse of a past memory, nearly drowning in a pool. Exhausted from it all and desiring an end to the relentless pursuit, Murphy jumps off the hotel roof, landing in a pool teeming with zombies, which breaks his fall. Addie desperately attempts to rescue Mac from a stairwell infested with zombies, but she arrives too late. Mac transforms into a zombie, and Addie is compelled to deliver Mercy. 
The man in the suit unveils a Z tattoo on his hand. Addie reunites with the team, channeling her anger and sorrow by using Murphy as a punching bag for a while. They collectively decide to head west as swiftly as possible, aiming to outpace the storm cloud that stirs up hazardous nuclear fallout. While the radiation clouds loom, the team must devise a fresh strategy to reach California. However, there are additional concerns to contend with. Cassandra is struggling with her quasi-zombie existence. A formidable new breed of terrifying zombies has emerged, and a surprise influx of survivors and bounty hunters has appeared. The procession of trucks and cars is under the ownership and operation of a man named Sam Custer, leading his group to Edmont, Canada. It's frigid there, and the zombies can't handle it. Yet, they have a considerable distance to cover through an area overrun by blasters the colossal zombies killed in the nuclear explosions. As the team decides to align their fate with the convoy, a lovable simpleton named Wrecking Ball pulls Murphy and Doc aside and introduces them to Z-Weed, a marijuana strain crafted from zombie corpses used as compost. When Custer discovers their indulgence, Murphy is mandated to ride in the medical wagon with individuals suffering from radiation poison, or as Addie and Roberta dub it, a ticking zombie bomb. After Murphy gets Cassandra Z stoned on Z-Weed, she becomes more Z-tastic than her recent behavior, albeit exhibiting a touch more coherence as well. During an assault on the convoy by a group of bounty hunters, Roberta and Vasquez realize their effective teamwork, while Cassandra saves Doc and Wrecking Ball by pouncing on a car's hood and gnawing off a man's face. This diversion grants enough time for Doc and Wrecking Ball to escape, although their vehicle is successfully hijacked, speeding away with the entire water supply of the convoy. The team manages to catch up with the water-laden vehicle and a blood-soaked Cassandra, who swiftly dispatches the carjackers. However, Murphy seizes the opportunity to hijack the vehicle himself, accompanied by Cassandra and Wrecking Ball. As anticipated, the medical wagon transforms into a zombie nursery, with one person dying and attacking another, setting off a vicious cycle. Amidst the onslaught of regular zombies and menacing blasters approaching from the road, Addie finds herself trapped. Just in the nick of time, 10K rescues Addie. While Roberta guides the team through a blockade of blasters, successfully detaching from the convoy. Unfortunately, Sam Custer, gradually losing his sanity due to radiation exposure, meets a gruesome fate as a blaster devours his face. Murphy, Cassandra, and their newfound ally Wrecking Ball are en route to the lab in Minneapolis that cultivates seaweed. Murphy and Cassandra are on a quest for more seaweed and have arrived at a lab in Minnesota. There, they discover a group of desperate survivors eager to obtain Batch 47, an alleged herbal vaccine against the zombie virus. Unfortunately, the greenhouse containing Batch 47 is infested not only with regular zombies but also with phytozombie, peculiar hybrids of plants and zombies. Just as the lab workers are preparing to send additional harvesters into the greenhouse, Murphy encounters Odegaard, the person in charge. To make matters worse, Dr. Walter Kurian, the antagonist from the season 1 finale and potentially responsible for the initial outbreak of the zombie virus, appears with severe burns on the side of his face. Meanwhile, Operation by Temark, in pursuit of Murphy, arrives at the lab and begins to investigate. They encounter a blonde woman and a young girl, who turn out to be kindred spirits, another woman raising a non-biological child due to the loss of her real mother. The dilemma arises when the little girl falls severely ill and repeatedly pleads with the blonde woman to prevent her from turning into a zombie. Murphy experiences a unique psychic connection with the plant zombies, sensing their pain, which seems to work both ways. He manages to acquire a sample of Batch 47 for the compassionate lab doctor, and they conduct an experiment on zombie heads preserved in jars. Meanwhile, Addie establishes contact with Citizen Z, who provides her with the new coordinates for the CDC in California. Interestingly, the same number she writes down has also been observed by Dr. Kirian. The team becomes entangled in assisting with the harvest of remaining seed pods to produce more of the herbal zombie vaccine. They exchange their firearms for gardening tools as a defense against the fight zombies and venture into the greenhouse. There, they encounter the menacing leader of the fight of zombies, adorned in green with shaggy vegetation and powerful psychic connections to Murphy. Murphy flees and crosses paths with Dr. Kirian, who reveals that individuals like Murphy, who are half-human and half-zombie, are the world's last hope. The Scorpion, the leader of the Zero's cartel, is identified by the Z-tattoo on his hand. When the lab doctor protests Hector's order to halt all Batch 47 experiments, Hector abruptly demands human trials and shoots the resulting alive zombie in the face. Murphy attempts to liberate the fight of zombies in the giant shop of horrors, but they suddenly turn against him, forcing the team to fight for their lives. When they successfully eliminate the fight of zombie leader, Murphy feels a deep sense of loss. Finally, Doc discovers the little girl and her surrogate mother in the barn, and he offers the batch 47 leaves to the child, who consumes them before succumbing to death. Serena, the pregnant woman searching for Murphy, encounters the group. As our fearless group fighting zombies and escorting Murphy to California ventures across the United States, we reach the magnificent state of Wisconsin. Here, they come across a cheese-themed parade infested with zombies. Since there are too many zombies for Murphy to control, 
It's best for everyone to make a hasty retreat with Serena in tow. It's worth noting that Serena, carrying Murphy's wrathful zombie baby, could go into labor at any moment. Roberta takes a moment to roll a colossal wheel of cheese through town, and the team watches in awe as it ensnares zombies in its enormous cheesy grasp. When the team comes under attack, they follow Vasquez's suggestion and seek refuge in a local Mennonite community. Vasquez seems to be formulating a plan by eavesdropping on the activities of the Zeros cartel. After 10k saves some Mennonites from a particularly menacing zombie and a zombie sheep, he is sprayed with a mysterious white substance, later revealed to be anthrax. Doc and Addy also get exposed to anthrax during the attack, despite Doc having received immunizations against numerous ailments. It's an extremely dire situation, no matter how you look at it. When 10k loses consciousness, the team discovers that the Mennonites possess a scarce antibiotic called Cipro. While it could save 10k, there's not enough for everyone. As a result, Addy, Vasquez, and a young community member ride into the nearest town, eliminating a meth head, only to find out that there are no antibiotics available for miles. Meanwhile, Serena goes into labor in the barn. Everyone tries to assist her, but she proves to be a challenging patient, and the baby itself is clearly unique. As Addy succumbs to anthrax exposure and the team faces the choice of saving her in 10k or witnessing their slow demise alongside the other Mennonites, Roberta makes a decision, they steal the Cipro, offer apologies to the community, and depart. When Serena gives birth, the zombies are drawn to the child wrapped in swaddling clothes, considering her something of a messiah. Eventually, the zombies attack Serena, furious when Murphy escapes with his daughter, whom he names Lucy. Roberta grants Serena mercy, and with the aid of antibiotics, 10K and Addy appear to be recovering. In Springfield, Illinois, our group of heroes engages in a fierce battle against a gang of Abe Lincoln zombies. Murphy and Cassandra utilize their supernatural zombie powers to maintain peace. The situation becomes even more critical as the zombie baby, Lucy, lacks a mother and has only consumed sugar water, leaving everyone uncertain about how to care for her. While 10K remains concerned about Cassandra, he also starts to question Vasquez's actions. Roberta takes it upon herself to investigate Vasquez's motives and leaves the team to check on Lucy. Addy, Doc, and 10K offer to care for Lucy temporarily to give Murphy a break, but the zombie baby daddy expresses his distrust and ventures into the woods with his dar, leaving Cassandra in charge of the team and instructing her to ensure that nobody leaves. Roberta catches up with Vasquez, only to discover that he's in trouble with the Zeros cartel. A gunfight erupts, turning several cartel members into zombies and injuring both Vasquez and Roberta. Seeking a place to treat their wounds, they head to a local hospital, where Vasquez reveals his backstory. He used to work as a D-agent but was coerced into working for the Zeros when they kidnapped his wife and child, threatening to kill them slowly if he refused. However, another cartel member offered a swift death for Vasquez's family with the condition that Vasquez would be indebted to him. In order to grant his wife and daughter mercy, Vasquez had no choice but to comply. Just as Vasquez divulges this information, his heartbeat stops. Roberta prepares to deliver mercy, but he regains consciousness just in time. Meanwhile, the team devises a plan to confuse Cassandra by splitting up and running in different directions, hoping she will pursue one of them while the other two search for Murphy and Lucy. However, the plan doesn't unfold as expected. Cassandra strategically decides to chase after Addie, leaving 10K and Doc with the dilemma of rescuing her. Unfortunately, 10K's attempt at a heartfelt conversation doesn't go well. Doc and Addie manage to escape, leaving this former promising couple to face off. Murphy stumbles upon a house in the woods and implores a heavily armed couple to take Lucy and raise her as their own. Initially, everyone agrees to the plan until the prospective foster parents catch a glimpse of the little monster, prompting them to instruct the zombie baby daddy to leave with his child. To save his own life, 10K is compelled to kill Cassandra. Tensions rise when Murphy reprimands 10K for giving Cassandra mercy, and Roberta inquires about the baby's whereabouts. It turns out Murphy bit the kind couple right in the face leaving Lucy behind to be raised by being similar to Cassandra, the quasi-zombie creatures they will soon become. The team reaches the formidable Mississippi River, a challenging obstacle to cross without a boat. However, the only available boat happens to be infested with zombies. After swiftly eliminating the zombies, the team continues south and encounters Sketchy and Skeezy. These two have just pillaged Graceland and are engaging in a new con called the Murphy, where they present Skeezy as the zombie messiah. Everything seems sketchy yet oddly charming until the boat becomes overwhelmed by a horde of zombies, resulting in the team getting separated from 10K. 10K becomes entangled in the various escapades orchestrated by Sketchy and Skeezy, including a close encounter with gun-toting hillbillies from whom they narrowly escape by claiming Skeezy's bite can immunize against the Z-virus, albeit rather clumsily. On the other side of the river, the team begins to argue over whether they should return to search for 10K or continue their journey. Doc insists that they dedicate 24 hours to finding him. But Roberta informs Doc that if they don't locate 10K by morning, they will have to move on without him. Sketchy and Skeezy stumble upon a dentist's truck and drive it to a nearby town. 
unbeknownst to them. The truck is part of an organized scheme involving human trafficking, murder, and transforming victims into zombies to serve as slave labor in a town led by a man named Tyler Burr, who dons a televangelist suit and exudes a dandy persona. Sketchy, skeezy, and 10K are welcomed into the fold due to the presence of zombies in the truck. Murphy remains angered by Cassandra's demise, and the team begins to disagree on the idea that their mission is solely to transport Murphy to California, considering everything and anyone hindering their progress is dispensable. In Burville, 10K finds himself entangled in a new romantic interest, which typically leads to trouble. We immediately worry for this girl, although she turns out to be the only one who takes 10K seriously when he mentions traveling with the Murphy. When Sketchy and Skeezy are put on trial by none other than a scorpion for stealing the truck, she emerges as the sole individual capable of saving 10K from dire consequences. Despite Sketchy's impassioned yet ultimately ineffective pleas for justice, a scorpion sentences them all to hanging. Fortunately, 10K's new love interest locates the team and guides them to the town. They storm in with guns blazing, liberating the zombie slaves, rescuing 10K, and hitting the road once again. The team is facing a shortage of supplies, and Murphy's newfound desire to consume brains is a significant and concerning development. In fact, when Murphy and Doc venture out to search for food, it's Murphy's craving for brains that leads to his capture in a pit alongside another zombie. The captive turns out to be a peculiar individual named Dean also known as the Collector, and it doesn't take him long to discover the true identity of his latest acquisition, Murphy. Dean places a shock collar on Murphy and takes him on a tour of his bizarre zombie museum. They engage in discussions about classic zombie films like White Zombie, eventually arriving at George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, where they agree that the best zombie stories are those that combine elements of both terror and humor, much like the one unfolding before their eyes, while Murphy seizes the opportunity to take a shower. The rest of the team tirelessly searches for him throughout the town, only to realize that there are very few people in the vicinity. After an attempted escape, Dean restrains Murphy to a chair on a makeshift television studio set and proceeds with an exclusive interview featuring none other than the Murphy. Dean collects DNA samples, extracts plasma and bone marrow, and continuously shocks his captive with the collar. Then, a rather significant moment occurs. Murphy tastes brains for the first time, triggering new neural connections in his mind. He becomes visibly emotional when discussing the daughter he had to give up. It turns out that Dean has been collecting various forms of zombies, including ones we have encountered before, such as radioactive zombies, phyta zombies, and blasters. He even possesses celebrity zombies, such as the iconic author George R. R. Martin dressed up in zombie attire, signing copies of his books repeatedly in a room. When Murphy makes another escape attempt, Dean reveals his even more deranged side and brutally electrocutes his captive, just as 10K arrives, inquiring if Dean has encountered a blue guy. 10K sees through Dean's facade and sneaks into the zombie museum, where he becomes a captive. Dean becomes fixated on witnessing the result of Murphy biting a human, specifically 10K. Eventually, Murphy convinces the zombie spectators to ambush Dean and devour him alive. Afterward, Murphy collapses due to weakness and needs to be wheeled out of the zombie museum by 10K. As the team regroups and prepares to hit the road once again, Murphy implores Roberta to promise that she won't leave him alone when they reach California. While Team Z makes their way toward Roswell, New Mexico, they stumble upon a perplexing phenomenon, a flying saucer that scans them with a blinding light. Intrigued by this encounter, they decide to stop at what used to be downtown Roswell, where they encounter a cult-like group known as the Extranauts. These individuals firmly believe that they will soon embark on a journey to outer space alongside a race of aliens. Leading the group is Bernadette, an alluring blonde woman who serves as their visionary leader. Bernadette claims to have received messages from the visitors, informing her that a group of people will arrive, bringing with them the emissary who will act as humanity's ambassador to the aliens, also known as Murphy. Understandably, both the team and one of the extranauts named Dan Scully are skeptical of these claims. Scully reveals a theory that the zombie apocalypse was actually orchestrated by aliens residing in the hollowed-out spaceship known as Pluto. He advises the team not to trust anything Bernadette says. Bernadette offers the team a brief tour of the deserted base, proclaiming that the aliens have chosen to save only a select few from the post-apocalyptic wasteland once known as Earth. She leads them to a hidden room that turns out to be an elevator, rapidly descending several miles underground. Inside the underground bunker, they come face to face with a zombie alien. The team eliminates the threat, causing it to explode in a spectacular fashion. Shortly after, Addie discovers an advanced computer system that controls the entire base and contains a significant amount of video footage featuring Murphy. Additionally, it reveals a star map and references something called Zona. Meanwhile, Bernadette insists that the team should refrain from killing the aliens, at least until one of them abducts her. As the team pursues the extraterrestrial kidnapper on the surface, they realize that Murphy and Bernadette are in communication with the alien spacecraft hinting at the possibility of their impending journey into outer space. 10K and Roberta stumble upon a remarkable firearm reminiscent of the men in black and successfully shoot down the UFO. 
Upon unmasking the alien pilot, they discover that it is none other than Dan Scully. He had been masquerading as an alien while salvaging the technology within the base and plans to transport it back to Zona. Scully explains that the aliens within the base were actually zombie test pilots before succumbing to his injury. The team grants him mercy. Bernadette informs the loyal extranauts of Roswell that the aliens have instructed them to patiently await the upcoming mass exodus from the planet. With their encounter in Roswell concluded, the team embarks on their next adventure, steadily drawing closer to their ultimate destination, California. Roberta and Vasquez engage in a fierce battle against a horde of zombies, followed by a passionate makeout session. However, the scene quickly shifts as Vasquez transforms into a zombie, revealing it to be a dream. Meanwhile, Citizen Z remains stationed at the North Pole, fighting off zombies while maintaining his morale and ammunition. The team faces a pressing issue. The Zanami, an enormous horde of zombies advancing across the desert, leaving destruction in its wake. In response, the team decides to divide their forces. Roberta, Vasquez, Murphy, and Addy embark on ATVs and discover the Northern Quest Casino Resort, a place unwilling to accept outsiders. On the other hand, Doc and 10K opt to seek higher ground independently. However, their journey takes a dark turn when they are ambushed by the son of Chief Dan Firecloud, who oversees the casino. Chief Firecloud doubts the severity of the Zanami but his daughter holds a different perspective. In the meantime, Addy strives to establish radio contact with Citizen Z, while Doc and 10K encounter trouble and find refuge in the care of the chief's daughter. The tribe remains wary of the zombie virus, labeling it as Zendigo and describing it as a soul disease. Doc embarks on a hallucinogenic experience facilitated by the medicine woman, who provides him with payout. However, their visitation is cut short as they are expelled from the camp and ensnared in a net. The tribe seeks a warning system against the approaching horde of zombies and designates 10K and Doc for that purpose. Employing astral projection, Doc eliminates a zombie that approaches their location. Ultimately, the chief's daughter rescues Doc and 10K, leading them to the casino where the team reunites. As the chief witnesses the impending zombie horde, he instructs his tribe to head for the sacred cliffs but opts to remain at the casino. Meanwhile, with Addy's successful radio contact with Citizen Z, she seeks assistance to resolve an issue with his malfunctioning missile launcher. Roberta steps in and enables Citizen Z to obliterate a zombie. When the zombie horde finally reaches the casino, its overwhelming force brings down the entire structure. The chief's daughter guides everyone to the sacred cliffs, where she reunites with her brother. Amidst the hallucinations from his vision quest, Doc gains inspiration from the ancestral drawings of the tribe, specifically the technique of guiding buffalo towards the cliff's edge, resulting in their demise. The team wards off the zombies with a wall of fire, redirecting them to plunge into the depths of the Grand Canyon. Murphy finds it incredibly challenging to witness his own tribe meet their demise, prompting Roberta and Vasquez to restrain him. With a touch of tough love, Roberta reminds Murphy that the time will come when he must choose which side to align with in the humans versus zombies battle. While he contemplates, she urges him to remember which side strives to keep him alive and which side seeks to consume his brain. Roberta wipes away a tear from Murphy's cheek, and the team continues their journey. Fresh off leading a horde of zombies straight into the depths of the Grand Canyon, the crew finds themselves battling zombies in a field filled with smoke. Seeking immediate shelter, they come across a hotel inhabited by a group of business people who rely heavily on voting, a talking stick, and an aggravating level of corporate leadership groupthink. These individuals have been holed up in the hotel since the outbreak began, stuck in a nightmarish corporate offsite. Leading the group is Dr. Gideon Good, a renowned expert in conflict resolution and corporate dialogue. Addy and Roberta take the initiative to negotiate resources with Gideon and his trusted associate, Dana, while 10K and Doc accompany the eccentric Kiki, who happens to be in charge of the food supply and holds the keys to the kitchen. Just as everyone settles into a semblance of harmony, gunshots ring out. The team rushes to the kitchen, where Murphy and Greg lie unconscious, both suffering from gunshot wounds. Gideon brandishes the talking stick, initiating an attempt at peaceful conflict resolution. Meanwhile, Doc and Vasquez realize that the bullet must have passed through Murphy and struck Greg, which theoretically should transform him into a Cassandra-like zombie. However, thanks to Murphy's blood, Greg is healing remarkably fast. When 10K is accused of being the shooter, he acknowledges that one day he may indeed kill Murphy, but until then, they are all on the same side. At that moment, Vasquez arrives with news of food theft. The hotel resident's suspect Iggy, given his kitchen access and control over the food storage locker. Consequently, Gideon banishes Iggy to the zombie-infested outdoors armed only with a mallet. Simultaneously, more treachery unfolds. A resident known as Washington is killed and subsequently turns into a zombie, attacking his fellow inhabitant Sheila. Seeking refuge, Addie and Dana take shelter in a closet, where they are saved from a zombie attack by Roberta and Vasquez. It becomes apparent that Murphy's dreams of the tribe lost at the Grand Canyon are attracting more zombies to the hotel, resulting in everyone being trapped in a single room. Tensions rise, accompanied by heated arguments until Doc realizes that Greg is awake. Greg, now resembling a Cassandra-like zombie, 
points out the true shooter, Travis, another hotel resident who has been planning to leave the hotel with Dana for some time. Greg shoots Travis, turning him into a zombie, and Addy dispatches him. Suddenly, a blood-soaked Iggy enters the scene, having survived his banishment. His fellow residents cheer as he strikes Gideon on the head with the talking stick, liberating them from Gideon's manipulative control. With the hotel residents freed from Gideon's influence, the team hits the road once again, continuing their journey. Upon reaching the border between the United States and Mexico, the team is faced with a colossal 2,000-mile wall that cannot be circumvented or scaled. Their ammunition quickly runs out, and Murphy's once effective psychic ability to control zombies appears to have vanished. It seems like an insurmountable obstacle until they are miraculously rescued by a scorpion, the formidable enforcer of the Zero's cartel. A scorpion leads them through a tunnel under the wall and into a lush compound where the inhabitants seemingly take pleasure in torturing zombies by leaving them to decompose as compost. This idyllic paradise is governed by La Riena de los Muertos, a force to be reckoned with. La Riena's primary ambition is to monopolize the zombie cure, and she possesses a doctor, the notorious Walter Kyrian, who can concoct it using Murphy's blood. Kyrian is essentially responsible for initiating the Z outbreak and triggering the detonation of nuclear weapons in Colorado. Roberta is determined to kill him. But Lariana dissuades her, emphasizing that Kyrian is the only individual in close proximity with the expertise to develop the antivirus. When Lariana offers the team a reward and the opportunity to join the Zeros in exchange for Murphy, Vasquez urges Roberta to accept the offer. Reluctantly, she agrees, and the team is whisked away to their initiation, a gladiator pit where they are compelled to kill a multitude of zombies. They accomplish this task with ease. And amidst the chaos, Vasquez finally comes face to face with the man who brutally murdered his wife and daughter years ago. Unsurprisingly, that man turns out to be a scorpion. Next, there's an 80-second style makeover montage in which everyone adorns themselves in fabulous new clothing and makeup. Doc even has his beard styled in pin curls. Meanwhile, Curian conducts experiments with the vaccine using human subjects, resulting in the creation of Cassandra-like half-zombies who mimic Murphy's every move. In the midst of an offering ceremony to the man whose blood saved humanity, Roberta confronts Murphy, demanding to know the extent of his promises to Curian. Murphy feigns innocence. But let's be real, Murphy always looks out for his own interest. Roberta also informs Vasquez that she approves of him killing a scorpion, but advises him to wait until they have a solid plan. However, Vasquez takes matters into his own hands and prepares to shoot a scorpion in the back of the head. Thinking swiftly, Roberta intercepts the bullet, an action interpreted by the Zeros as saving La Riena's life. Vasquez is subsequently captured and subjected to torture. During the interrogation, a scorpion mentions Zona. Meanwhile, Curian prepares to inject Vasquez with his vaccine as his sinister plan is unveiled, administer the serum to a person, manipulate Murphy into controlling him to simulate a successful vaccine outcome, and then inject Lorena so that Murphy can exert control over her, effectively dominating the entire world. The members of Team Z remain confined within Lorena's compound in Mexico. Walter Curian and Murphy devise a scheme to produce a counterfeit vaccine that would transform the entire Zero's gang into half-zombies under Murphy's control. Vasquez is on the verge of being the first to receive the injection. Fortunately, Roberta intervenes and persuades Lariana that Dr. Kyrian should be the initial recipient. There is some hesitation, but ultimately, Kyrian administers the vaccine to himself. As a test of its efficacy, he allows a zombie to bite him, and it appears that the vaccine actually works. All of Lariana's followers receive injections, resulting in them feeling somewhat disoriented. When Lariana insists that Roberta should be next, Murphy steps in and prevents her from receiving the vaccine. This raises suspicions from a scorpion, who seeks permission to continue assaulting Vasquez. Given that a scorpion is responsible for shooting Vasquez's wife and daughter, Vasquez desires nothing more than to kill him. Now that Dr. Kyrian is completely under Murphy's control, Roberta discovers that Murphy is assembling a blended army, which infuriates her. The team's plan is still to reach California, even if they have to forcefully take Murphy. However, before that, they embark on a high-stakes rescue mission to save Vasquez. Then, something unexpected happens to all those who received the injection. They suddenly turn against Murphy. It appears that he cannot fully control his new army as they only seem to desire his blood, and possibly his brains as well. Roberta saves Murphy by beheading Dr. Kyrian, and the group successfully rescues Vasquez. In a final, desperate attempt to escape the compound, they allow the actual zombies to enter and engage in a battle against the blended ones. It may seem like a reckless plan, but it proves effective. As the team emerges into the outside world, they encounter a scorpion. After an intense and vengeful brawl, Vasquez hurls a scorpion back into the bunker, where he becomes a feast for the zombies. They then embark on their journey to California in a fleet of impressively formidable El Caminos. Lorena and Dr. Curian's disembodied heads appear to have survived the entire ordeal. Citizen Z, formerly arrested on espionage charges for his hacking escapades, was later recruited by the NSA and stationed at the Northern Light Listening Post before the zombie outbreak. 
Presently, Citizen Z realizes that he has been hacked by unknown entities. The team, on the other hand, faces difficulties as their fleet of El Caminos is in disrepair. They must continue on foot through the remains of Disneyland and California to reach the CDC and deliver Murphy. Roberta ponders, how did it all come to this? Leading to a glimpse into Roberta Warren's backstory. As a lieutenant in the National Guard, she was compelled to eliminate fellow soldiers who had turned at her base. Doc, as it turns out, worked as an addiction counselor and possessed a talent for soothing individuals with the power of hugs at a center. When the zombies emerged, he fled after witnessing patients and colleagues transform into zombies. Addie's origin story involves her encounter with Mac Thompson during a hockey game, which ultimately resulted in everyone turning into zombies. Addie had to make her way back home to her brother and mother, and we know the unfortunate outcome. 10K found himself alone in the woods when he was attacked by Z Hunters and a park ranger. After a lengthy chase, 10K, known simply as Tommy at the time, was rescued by his father, though we are aware of his father's fate. However, Vasquez's origin story is undoubtedly the most impressive and terrifying. On the first day of the outbreak, during the funeral for his wife and daughter, Vasquez encountered a shocking sight, the funeral director and zombie versions of his wife and daughter emerging from their coffins. Meanwhile, in the present, Citizen Z traces the hackers and discovers that they have been monitoring Operation by Temark all along. Realizing that he may unwittingly lead a potential threat to Murphy, he takes the decisive step of destroying his servers. Murphy himself grows increasingly apprehensive about the future at the CDC, which triggers a dark flashback to his own day one. Murphy was imprisoned for postal fraud, and chaos erupted when inmates started turning into zombies. In the midst of the pandemonium, Murphy managed to escape and lock the gate, leaving others, including those who hadn't turned, trapped inside. It was a reprehensible act, and perhaps now he seeks redemption as the hope for humanity, as Roberta puts it. Upon arriving at what they believe to be the CDC coordinates, the team discovers a dilapidated restaurant occupied by a kind lady who offers them tea. While Citizen Z attempts to rectify the hacking damage and urgently contacts Operation by Temark to inform them of the compromise and abort the mission, his efforts prove futile. The team has already reached the given CDC coordinates, only to discover it's a charming little restaurant situated in the middle of nowhere. Engaging in conversation with Auntie, the owner of the establishment and the one to approach if seeking the bounty on Murphy, the team settles in. Suddenly, a group of bounty hunters arrives with a counterfeit Murphy. Chaos ensues, resulting in a gunfight that claims the lives of all the bounty hunters, but not before 10K sustains a gunshot wound to the stomach. Andy contacts the CDC, which surprisingly operates from a submarine. Military personnel and Maryland merch arrive, promising assistance for 10K while taking Murphy away to develop a genuine vaccine. Emotions run high as the team bids a heartfelt farewell to Murphy, believing their mission to be complete. However, their respite is short-lived as the CDC departs and another party opens fire on the team. It turns out to be the Zeros, led by a completely deranged Larine. Thankfully, Anti has concealed spare weapons and ammunition behind the bar. On the submarine, Murphy discovers that the crew belongs to a society residing on a zombie-free island known as Dona. He notices the peculiar glowing eyes of everyone on the sub, a side effect of the current vaccine that only slows down the virus's progression. Murphy initially agrees to participate in tests for a new vaccine but suddenly incapacitates Dr. Merch, stating that he is going to do something he should have done a long time ago. Simultaneously, a fierce shootout erupts at Auntie's restaurant, culminating in Auntie's transformation into a zombie and Doc granting her mercy. Roberta engages in an intense battle with La Rienne, ultimately overcoming her with the help of a scorpion. A scorpion apologizes to Vasquez for his past actions offering him the opportunity for revenge. However, Vasquez spares a scorpion's life and bids farewell to Roberta before disappearing into the woods. Roberta, Doc, and Addy accept a scorpion's invitation to join him on the road, as he possesses an ample supply of food, water, ammunition, and seaweed to sustain them for a month. Addy humorously ponders, worst case scenario, we kill him and take the truck. Upon reaching the ocean, they witness Murphy's escape from the submarine as he races toward the shore on a speedboat, accompanied by Dr. Merch and the captain, both bearing Murphy's bite marks. Notably, 10K is not seen. The season 2 finale concludes with the team falling into an ambush by Chinese soldiers, while Citizen Z encounters an enigmatic woman during his journey through the frozen wasteland of the North Pole. Additionally, young Lucy has rapidly grown to the size of a six-year-old and is last seen enjoying a tea party with two zombies. A young, attractive folks lounging poolside, seemingly unconcerned about the zombie apocalypse. An elegant lady brings a phone to a table, and a weathered hand belonging to an older individual picks it up. This hand dials a number and contacts a sharply dressed bald man known only as the man. This man possesses a metal container full of prisoners in hoods, his infamous list. There's one name still untouched, Dr. Harold Teller. Dr. Teller is hiding at Mercy Labs, now a secluded compound for a few survivors. They won't surrender Teller to the man. In response, the man seizes Nature Boy, 
a nearly wild child, and uses him as leverage, giving Teller 24 hours to reveal himself. Nature Boy regains consciousness and escapes from the man's vehicle upon discovering a live zombie in the trunk with him. He dashes through the wilderness and accidentally encounters 10K, who, along with Roberta, Addy, Doc, and a half Zeke Cassandra, is battling zombies. Murphy is also there, holding his zombie be Lucy. Following a brief encounter with Nature Boy's sister, Red, the group returns the siblings to the compound. Soon after, they're enlisted by Dr. Harold Teller to protect the place from the man and his armed followers. Rumor has it that the man acts as some sort of avenging angel, targeting scientists linked to the zombie virus outbreak. Given that Dr. Teller's work was supposedly focused on fungus-based painkillers, he's perplexed about being on the man's list. The actual nature of Teller's research is unveiled when Murphy begins hearing whispering voices. He tracks them to Teller's lab, where he discovers two severely deformed people in prison, begging for mercy. The shock deepens when one of them turns out to be Dr. Teller's wife, Dr. Sarah Teller. The Tellers were developing a fungus-based antidote for the Z virus. When zombies attacked the lab, the cure became airborne, shielding the infected from turning into ZS but turning them into grotesque fungus monsters. This revelation rattles Murphy, who wishes to leave, but Roberta convinces the team to stay and protect the compound from the man. Meanwhile, 10K forms a bond with Red and Nature Boy, whom Doc playfully dubs 5K after the kid starts emulating his new role model, adopting jet black hair and all. 5K was raised by crows, so he possesses survival instincts and has become adept with a slingshot, thanks to 10K's tutelage. As the sun sets on this peculiar day, Roberta conducts reconnaissance around the perimeter and spots the man. However, it turns out to be a zombie decoy, and the man and his troops knock Roberta unconscious. She is now among the hooded prisoners. Nonetheless, the team at the lab sticks with what Doc terms Plan A. Plan A involves liberal use of red paint transforming the compound's walls and metal sheets into an imposing fortress. Everyone dons red hazmat suits, embracing a color scheme evoking violence, blood, and intensity. Will this be enough to unsettle the man? He presents his own red item, Roberta's bandana, and demands an exchange for Dr. Teller. Doc needs proof that Roberta is alive. He obtains more than that when Roberta speaks on the walkie-talkie, freed from the metal shed thanks to 5K knocking out the guard with his slingshot. In response, the man releases a swarm of zombies. This provides an opportunity for everyone to showcase their marksmanship, learned from Roberta. She, 10K, Red, and 5K circle back to provide support. The man then deploys a trump card, a squad of zombies with makeshift metal helmets that render them mercy-proof, protecting their heads. The gang is overwhelmed and retreats to the lab. Sarah and her fellow fungus creatures reveal their combat skills, dispatching the man's henchmen. Sadly, Sarah sustains severe injuries, prompting Dr. Teller to grant her mercy. Suddenly, the wall erupts, and the man emerges from the wreckage, clad in an improvised hazmat suit made of sarin wrap and duct tape, complete with a helmet. He incapacitates Dr. Teller and carries him away, leaving Murphy in awe. The gang deals with the remaining mercy-proofed zombies using well-coordinated gunplay, escaping the lab. They spot a helicopter transporting the man's container of prisoners to an unknown destination. Red is devastated to learn that 5K is missing, and she charges into a horde of approaching zombies in a fit of rage. The metal container arrives at the upscale house glimpsed. The prisoners are brought poolside, their hoods removed, and they confront their enigmatic host. Meanwhile, 5K rests in a field, surrounded by a group of crows. Roberta, Addie, Doc, and Hector find themselves encircled by Pan-Asian soldiers, led by Sun Mei. She's traveled all the way from Beijing in pursuit of the Murphy, aiming to cultivate a cure for the zombie virus. Initial tensions aside, the operation by Temark team gradually establishes a somewhat friendly rapport with Sun Mei's squad. Together. They trek through the wilderness towards a supply drop, contending with the usual persistent zombies and a new menace, deranged, famished, feral humans known as the Enders. Sun Mei's crew is well equipped with advanced weaponry like the anti-zombie grenade, which deploys multiple green lasers for targeting and launches nail-like projectiles that detonate upon impact. Additionally, they present Addy with an enhanced Z-Whacker featuring electrifying enhancements. Murphy reaches the shore accompanied by the submarine's captain and Dr. Murch, both influenced by his bites. 10K is also with them, begrudgingly aligned with his least favorite person. Murphy has grown disillusioned with humanity and rejects the idea of providing a cure for Zona. He devises his own post-apocalyptic strategy, populating the world with blends, essentially humans under Murphy's control. Meanwhile, the journey to the supply drop proves perilous, resulting in Sun Mei losing her entire troop along the way. Upon finally reaching the supplies, they discover the cache has been plundered. Murphy has beaten them to it, arriving in a fortified military vehicle. Murphy and Roberta engage in a tense confrontation, with Murphy having a sniper, 10K, ready to act if anyone makes a suspicious move, 10K, who has now been bitten by Murphy. Failing to persuade Roberta and her group to join his cause, 
Murphy departs, leaving them to hike back to Hector's truck and embark on their new mission, preventing Murphy from propagating his new race of blends. Citizen Z and his faithful dog are saved from freezing by a girl named Kaya. In their last encounter, Citizen Z appears to be settling into a semi-retired existence in the zombie-free hinterlands, alongside Kaya's aunt and uncle Kasky. The mysterious figure known as the man possesses a scrap of paper with Murphy's name on it. He traces the trail left by Murphy's vehicle. The group is closely tailing Murphy's path while Sun Mei traces his hijacked military vehicle, affectionately dubbed the Murphy Mobile by Hector. However, they soon realize that Murphy has discarded the transponder within a zombie's body. Their knowledge of his whereabouts dwindles, and they find themselves in McLeod, California, grappling with shortages of fuel, sustenance, and provisions. Unexpectedly, they encounter an unlikely ally, Wally Becker, a former postal worker who uses a mail truck and takes refuge in the local post office. Wally, despite his apparent loneliness, reads undelivered Christmas cards and feeds zombies what he claims is Rodko. This raises suspicion, particularly since the zombified residents of McLeod follow him exclusively due to their affection for him, though they ignore others. Roberta is especially wary, given this odd behavior. Sun May attempts to communicate with her laboratory through a two-way radio at a local motor pool but she only picks up a melancholic tune. This melody acts as a code indicating the mission's termination and the demise of her reinforcements. Elsewhere, Kaya encourages Citizen Z to regain his strength and return to broadcasting, though he questions whether anyone remains to listen. Kaya's efforts to use her radio yield no results until she stumbles upon the same tune played by Sun Mae's team. While she finds it beautiful, Citizen Z perceives it as sorrowful. Addy tries to use the radio to contact Citizen Z, who can hear her but lacks the necessary equipment to respond effectively. The communication abruptly ceases, leaving Addy frustrated. Later, Roberta's group, now in a functional postal van, informs Citizen Z about Sun Mei and their inability to reach him. Citizen Z learns that Kaya and her family are starving. He realizes their dire situation when they rapidly consume the food he shares. This prompts him to suggest a solution for their hunger. In McLeod, the survivors grow weary of the enigma surrounding the zombie's fixation on Wally. Roberta takes Wally's firearm, while Sun Mei collects a blood sample from him. Wally's blood exhibits no peculiarities. Following this, Wally agrees to provide supplies and food in exchange for their departure. As Sun Mei conducts further blood tests, Wally leads the group to what he claims is a fully stocked emergency shelter in the basement. To their dismay, they discover numerous postal workers' corpses, accompanied by a horde of zombies waiting to attack. Wally escapes as a battle ensues. Wally takes Sun Mei hostage and guides her to his workshop, a grisly space adorned with remains. There, he reveals his twisted motive, 17 years of resentment as a mailman, receiving no greeting cards or love letters, only disdain for his job. During the outbreak's onset, Wally exacted revenge, killing his co-workers and the town's inhabitants, becoming the last image they saw before turning into zombies. Sun Mei opens the door, unleashing zombies into the room. They overwhelm and kill Wally, transforming him into one of them. She reunites with the group, and they flee McLeod, leaving the transformed Wally behind. Elsewhere, Team Murphy faces traffic jams due to a blocked road in the zombie-infested landscape. They encounter a desperate young couple whose dying daughter elicits Murphy's sympathy. Moved by their plight, Murphy offers to help and administers a Murphy bite to the child. Arriving in Spokane, Washington, Murphy's group finds a waterfall pivotal to his plan of creating blends. They settle at the Museum of Progress, where Murphy establishes Dr. Murch's lab, his personal quarters, and his throne room. A place for Lucy is also designated. Much to 10K's surprise and subsequent disappointment as he's assigned to sweeping duty. Murphy reclines on his throne when Dr. Murch informs him of visitors, the couple whose daughter he saved. Grateful for curing their child and relieving her fears, the parents thank Murphy. Their daughter embraces Murphy, and her father humorously asks if Murphy would bite his wife. Murphy smiles. Meanwhile, Citizen Z, Pup, Kaya, Nana, and Uncle Kasky journey on a sled back to the Northern Light military base through icy conditions. Roberta, Hector, Sun Mei, Addy, and Doc stumble upon a bridge adorned with gutted zombies, bearing the ominous message thieves written in blood on the wall. After dispatching the zombies, the group encounters armed locals who reveal that their town fell victim to the Red Hand, a fanatical band of vigilantes led by the enigmatic Escorpion. An attack by the Red Hand forces the gang to seek refuge in an abandoned novelty factory. Hector speculates that this Escorpion might either be an impersonator or someone adopting the former Escorpion's sinister legacy. Meanwhile, Sun Mei and Doc prepare for an improvised dental procedure on Addy, who's suffering from a debilitating infected tooth. Roberta inquires about the Red Hand's vendetta against the locals, Clive and Ryan. It turns out that the town incurred their wrath by stealing the Red Hand's food supply, leading to the bloody warning on the bridge. The Red Hand strikes again, launching an assault on the factory with Molotov cocktails and zombies rigged with explosives. An explosion nearly claims Roberta's life. Clive and Ryan identify the tattoo on Hector's arm, branding him as a scorpion though possibly not the one they're seeking. 
Faced with no other option, Hector is compelled to kill them both, following their deaths. The Red Hand retreats, prompting the gang to hit the road once more. Meanwhile, at the Museum of Progress in Spokane, Murphy pressures Dr. Merch to develop the vaccine that will transform his growing followers into blends, paving the way for his envisioned new Murphy order. Murphy's health falters due to his frequent blood donations for research. Dr. Merch discloses that Murphy requires periodic injections of the original Z virus vaccine to prevent devolving into a state akin to patient zero in Colorado. Dr. Merch administers the original vaccine to 10K in secret, freeing him from Murphy's control. She and 10K plan to destroy the blend vaccine and escape. However, Murphy catches wind of their rebellion and infects Dr. Merch with a fresh mind-controlling bite. Just before Murphy can test the blend vaccine on 10K, he seizes an opportunity to escape, clutching a bag of the original vaccine and plunging into the turbulent waterfall, evading Murphy's pursuit. In a final act of defiance, Dr. Merch takes extreme measures to liberate herself from Murphy's influence. She ventures into Murphy's zombie moat and injects herself with the original vaccine. As the zombies swarm around her, Murphy screams in protest, witnessing the end of his control over Dr. Merch. Surviving his plunge into the Spokane Rapids, 10K makes it back to shore clutching the bag of the original vaccine, also known as Murphy's medicine. However, he finds himself immersed in a series of crises. Murphy's lead enforcer, Will, is quickly on his trail, tracing 10K's path through the woods by the blood drops from his reopened stomach wound. In this unforgiving wilderness, 10K encounters an unexpected savior, a vision of Red, his former love interest who perished. Red assists 10K in navigating the treacherous terrain, which proves fortunate as a new threat lurks, a seemingly wolf-like pack with distinct characteristics. Securing a motorbike and a firearm from a passing traveler, 10K falls into a trap set by bandits, ending up chained to an abandoned vehicle. Stripped of his usual weaponry, 10K ingeniously employs car parts, windshield wipers, hubcaps, to fend off attacking zombies. Will, empowered by Murphy's bite, dispels the remaining zombies and captures 10K leading them towards the bandits and the stolen bag of Murphy's medicine. Will fails to comprehend why 10K seeks to distance himself from Murphy, as Murphy saved Will's family and eradicated their fears. When a zombie overwhelms 10K, his conviction wavers under the notion that Will might have a valid point. They stumble upon the stolen motorbike and the corpse of one bandit, surrounded by numerous tracks diverging in various directions. This unnerves Will, who insists on an immediate return to Murphy. 10K seizes an opportunity, seemingly ending his life by leaping off a cliff. Following cries resembling his fallen ally, 5K, 10K tracks the sounds to a clearing where wolf-like creatures gather. 10K defeats them using a metal post, only to uncover the female bandit, now a zombie, beneath them. After dispatching her, 10K retrieves the bag of Murphy's medicine. He experiences a final hallucination with Red and 5K, who, in this dreamlike realm or afterlife, can speak and boast 1,139 zombie kills. Meanwhile, Murphy's stability wavers further. He interrogates the remains of Dr. Merch, who chose to meet her end in the zombie-infested moat rather than continue serving Murphy. Murphy struggles to grasp her decision, her refusal to live in the world he aspires to rebuild. Her notes remain indecipherable to him. Fueled by his unchecked urges due to neglecting his medicine, Murphy consumes Dr. Merch's brain, gaining comprehension of her scientific jargon. This revelation enables him to continue her work. Will returns to Murphy, claiming 10K's demise. Murphy remains skeptical. Believing that 10K will ultimately return to Roberta and the group, Doc finds himself separated from the group and involuntarily admitted to the Serenity Falls Institution for the Criminally Insane, a psychiatric hospital inhabited by an eclectic assortment of patients overseen by Nurse Ratched. The facility is surrounded by zombies. After being knocked unconscious by a patient who mistakes him for Elvis, Doc regains consciousness restrained in a straitjacket, under the scrutiny of Nurse Ratched and her cohorts. Doc's spontaneous psychological assessment of the patients impresses them enough to earn his release from restraints and a role as Nurse Ratched's colleague. Ratch takes Doc to meet the institution's most recent and problematic arrival, 10K, who's nearly catatonic due to the lack of the vaccine preventing him from succumbing to Murphy's control. Nurse Ratched had scheduled a lobotomy for 10K, but Doc persuades her that 10K is suffering from 10K fever and requires medication. Doc learns of a fully stocked pharmacy on the Z Ward, a section overrun by zombies turned during electroshock therapy. Doc and Elvis navigate the wing, retrieve the drugs, and return in time to prevent Nurse Ratched's intended lobotomy. Doc administers an impromptu cocktail to 10K, followed by medication to address various patients' conditions. Elvis brings 10K, who's feeling super mellow, to Doc's presence, and 10K updates Doc on Murphy's plan to establish a new world order in Spokane. They endeavor to escape from the institution. However, Nurse Ratched intercepts their escape attempt, having them restrained in straitjackets. After Doc informs her of their mission to take Murphy to the CDC for a Z-virus cure, Ratch dismisses their claims as delusional. She prepares to perform a lobotomy on Doc, but a robust patient named Bob intervenes, killing Ratched. The patients rebel. 
Doc rallies the patients, fleeing to a bus parked outside as zombies breach the feeble barricades. Outside, 10K collapses, and the patients depart in the bus, leaving Doc and 10K behind. Doc discovers 10K's Murphy bite and worries about his friend's condition and the contents of the vials in his back. 10K implores Doc not to disclose his state to Roberta and the group. The patients depart aboard the chaotic bus, crushing a zombie on their journey to an undisclosed destination. The man roams the open wilderness, evading a shot aimed at him, and swiftly decapitates the shooter with his machete. He discovers a corpse marked with a bulldog tattoo, a symbol he uses to infiltrate Murphytown. In another scenario, a poor bastard is pursued through the woods by a group of zombie children led by Wesson, a member of Murphy's officers. The poor bastard finds refuge in a tree but succumbs to the persuasive charm of the good word of Murphy. The scene transitions to him grinning as a blend within Murphy's stronghold in Spokane. Wesson selects individuals for the blend vaccine based on their skills. Murphy's vision of a new world order necessitates a diverse workforce including farmers, electricians, bankers, and more. Though some professions, like bankers, are assigned less glamorous tasks such as latrine duty, skills deemed valuable result in vaccination, a feat Murphy achieves by consuming Dr. Murch's brain. Murphy detects the man outside the fence, his name being the sole entry on the man's list. The man seems to be planning an insider action, possibly aided by having received the blend vaccine. Meanwhile, Doc and 10K reunite with Roberta, Addie, Sun Mei, and Hector. Roberta expresses skepticism about 10K's condition, but he conceals his blend status, despite Doc's reassurances. 10K discloses Murphy's grand intentions in Spokane, along with the Red Hand's grim deeds along their journey. Murphy's campaign proceeds as the team encounters a truck broadcasting his fear no more, guaranteed message. The vehicle is attacked by the Red Hand, with the blend driver dead at the wheel, highlighting that blends don't reanimate as zombies after death. 10K divulges Murphy's plan to retrieve Lucy, his daughter, from Springfield, IL. Speculating that Lucy might inherit her father's immunity, Sun May proposes retrieving her before Murphy does. The group splits, with Doc and Addie pursuing Lucy, while Roberta, Sun May, Hector, and 10K aim to thwart Murphy's new world order in Spokane. Upon reaching the city's outskirts, 10K flees when Hector discovers his Murphy bite. At the Museum of Progress, Murphy convenes with associates to discuss restoring power. Suspecting opposition to his plans, Murphy orders a basic training program for stronghold defense. The man offers assistance to Murphy and gruesomely demonstrates his skills by extracting poor bastard's brains for Murphy's research. Testing the man's loyalty, Murphy commands him to consume the displayed brains, which he does eagerly. A flashback reveals the man's use of a severed arm to mimic the blend inoculation. Murphy tests the man's allegiance by ordering a brain feast. Later, the man confronts Murphy, presenting his severed hand. He aims to deliver Murphy to an unknown client but is interrupted when Cassidy overpowers him. Handcuffed to Murphy's throne, the man learns that Murphy's daughter is safe. Murphy witnesses the restoration of power atop a clock tower, with electricity illuminating Spokane. However, the man escapes, leaving Murphy with a severed hand and a defiant message. Meanwhile, Citizen Z leads Kaya and her family to the Northern Light Listening Station, restoring power and broadcasting a message of hope received by Doc and Addie as they head to Springfield. While on their way to find Lucy in Illinois, Doc and Addie's truck breaks down, leaving them no choice but to continue on foot. The sound of sirens heralds the arrival of an unusual sight, a retro presidential limousine occupied by none other than their old acquaintances, Sketchy and Skeezy. Sketchy has taken on the role of president of the apocalypse, with Skeezy serving as his campaign manager. Despite their skepticism, Doc and Addie join them on their journey to Waldrug, South Dakota. Addie muses about the antics of these two characters, comparing them to Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Upon reaching Waldrug, they enter a saloon and orchestrate a spectacle to draw the town's inhabitants out of hiding. Sketchy's impassioned speech wins the favor of the locals, though his interactions with them raise suspicion from the town's elected mayor, who questions his presidential claim. Doc follows a local to a quarantine area where people are dying from a mysterious illness characterized by a yellow iris. Addie is ready to leave when Skeezy's scam starts falling apart, but Doc convinces her to stay and help the town unravel the mystery. Zombies from a neighboring town, Rosebud, begin invading Waldrug. It's revealed that Rosebud's residents have also fallen victim to the same illness. Doc takes initiative, hotwires a motorcycle, and rides to Rosebud. There, he discovers that a contaminated water source is the cause of the illness shared between the two towns. However, Sketchy, focused on the election and fundraising efforts, rejects Doc's findings, leading to tensions. Amid the chaos, zombies and disgruntled victims of Sketchy and Skeezy's past cons create havoc. In the midst of it all, Addie and Doc commandeer the limousine and escape the chaos of South Dakota. In an unexpected twist, it turns out that Doc inadvertently wins the election and becomes the true winner. Their adventure with Sketchy and Skeezy and Waldrug ends with a mix of humor, chaos, and unexpected outcomes. At Northern Light, Citizen Z and Kaya are broadcasting until Murphy interrupts, using their frequency to promote his Fear No More campaign and his Murphy Miracle vaccine. 
Meanwhile, Roberta, Sun Mei, and Hector are preparing to infiltrate Murphy's compound. Sun Mei discusses her experimental vaccine that aims to weaken Murphy's mind control while retaining immunity to the Z virus. Roberta sneaks after Murphy, who heads to Porta Pot as labeled Mr. Murphy and everyone else. Hiding in her designated stall, Roberta's cover is blown when a horde of zombies approaches. She escapes through the back wall just in time, infuriating Murphy. Meanwhile, 10K, captured again, is questioned by Murphy about Roberta's plans, but he remains silent, recognizing that she can't take on Murphy alone. Roberta decides to seek the help of an existing army, the Red Hand, who are known for enforcing justice. Hopper, claiming to be the Red Hand's drug dealer, leads them to a scorpion, their leader. A scorpion's story closely resembles Hector's own history. Guided by Hopper, Roberta, Hector, and Sun may venture into underground Seattle, the Red Hand's headquarters, characterized by eerie decorations and a brutal sense of justice. After an encounter with Z.S., they meet a scorpion, revealed to be Javier Vasquez, a former member of Operation by Temark. However, Vasquez has lost his sanity, having reinvented himself as a scorpion, the enforcer of the Zero's gang that killed his family. He doesn't recognize Roberta or Hector, even after their attempts to jog his memory. Roberta and Hector's emotional tactics fail to trigger his recollection. Vasquez attacks Hector, but Roberta kills him with her machete. Hector is injected with Sun May's experimental vaccine and doesn't turn into a zombie after succumbing to his wounds. The Red Hand members, who witnessed this, seem to pledge their allegiance to Roberta. They accompany her back to Spokane to confront Murphy. Meanwhile, Doc and Addie reach Lucy's home in Springfield, IL, witnessing her interacting with zombies. Lucy's adoptive father confronts them with a shotgun. In a surprising twist, Hector regains consciousness with cat-like eyes, suggesting a potential transformation into a new kind of zombie-human blend. The story takes unexpected turns as the group confronts their past and prepares to face Murphy's forces. In the Museum of Progress, things are getting darker as Murphy dives into the Enigma of 10K. He instructs him to perform the knife game, a move popularized by Bishop the Android in Aliens. 10K follows the order, even cutting his fingers, and is also given the original vaccine by Murphy. This vaccine can restore his humanity, but 10K refuses to take it. Murphy is the one making the decisions here. Others seem to embrace being blends, but 10K remains nearly catatonic. Maybe it's the name, 10K. It's not just a name, it's his mission, his purpose. Does he need a new mission, a new purpose? Murphy suggests one and nicknames him Thomas. Meanwhile, Doc and Addie face Ma Kettle and Pa Kettle at gunpoint, the guardians of Lucy, Murphy's hybrid daughter. Lucy appears older than expected due to being Murphy's child. Doc and Addie try convincing Lucy's foster parents that they know her real father and want to take her to him. However, they're almost in danger when they can't provide the correct password set by Murphy for anyone seeking his daughter. Doc thinks it's Smurf due to Lucy's blue skin like her dad's, but it's incorrect. Fortunately, Lucy takes a liking to them and wants to play. Lucy's playtime involves zombies dressed as pirates, princesses, and more. Her Z-controlling power keeps her safe, but it's risky for Doc and Addie. A game of hide-and-seek turns tragic when Doc Mercy kills a hostile zombie, prompting Lucy to throw a tantrum and flee into the woods. She encounters an ender, but Addie rescues her. Back at the house, Lucy inquires about her mother, leading Doc to spin an elaborate story about Murphy and Serena as the apocalypse's king and queen. In his tale, Lucy is conceived through a blueberry pie, explaining her blue skin. Why did Lucy's mother leave? After protecting Lucy from zombies, she had to rest in a distant land. Things seemed to be going well when Ma and Pa Kettle agree to let Lucy travel with Doc and Addie to see her father. However, the man appears, attacking Lucy's foster parents and making them doubt Doc and Addie. The man takes Lucy, leaving Doc to mercy kill Pa Kettle. But grieving Ma tries to harm Doc until Addie intervenes, finishing her off. To find the man and rescue Lucy, Doc and Addie split up. Doc contacts Citizen Z or Roberta while Addie chases the man on a motorbike. Meanwhile, Lucy's abduction doesn't go as planned. She talks non-stop to the man, who tries to silence her with a taser. Lucy finds it amusing and asks for more. The man takes drastic measures, hooding Lucy and tying a rope around her neck. Strangely, Murphy, miles away in Spokane, feels the experience psychically, struggling to breathe and feeling hot. And there's more. When the man removes the hood, he's in for a surprise. Lucy has aged five years. 10K departs from the Museum of Progress, studying a note containing Murphy's new mission. The writing is partially obscured, but find Warren and bring her to me. Is discernible, hinting at his upcoming task. Doc finds himself in an open field, holding a handheld radio tuned to a sultry female voice reciting Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Tracking the signal's origin, he arrives at a castle-like structure with a central radio antenna. Entering the garden, he encounters bedazzled zombies resistant to gunfire. These zombies are somewhat domesticated, roughing up Doc instead of attacking him. He glimpses the women responsible, Sarah, Linda, and Camilla, who exude an alluring yet deranged vibe. Doc becomes their guest of honor, awakening in a luxurious bedroom with hand-knitted clothes. The women pamper him, serving stew and dandelion wine. 
Despite the comfort, Doc needs to contact Citizen Z using their radio. They allow him to try, but his efforts fail. Suspicion arises when the microphone's wires aren't connected. Unaware of any danger, Doc enjoys their company while they wait for Sunrise to test the radio. Sarah shares her macabre scrapbook. Linda plays the organ, and Camilla recites poetry. Doc discovers that the microphone's wires are disconnected, hinting at deception. Still, he relishes their companionship. The lady's affection for Doc leads to them interrupting his attempts to rest, culminating in a room full of lingerie-clad women. Doc wakes surrounded by them. Missing his clothes, he heads to the kitchen, only to find Stu with a finger in the sink. A transmission from Kaya prompts Doc to investigate the radio. He encounters disconnected wires under the table. As Linda attacks, he retreats. Exploring further, Doc realizes the women's gruesome decoration with human remains. He finds male prisoners and learns that they're him from the near future. The women create art from their captives' bodies. Freeing a prisoner, Doc returns to the living room, facing the masked women wielding weapons. The basement prisoners intervene, allowing Doc to escape to the radio tower. Doc fixes the radio, contacting Citizen Z about Lucy's kidnapping and Addie's pursuit. Camilla, Linda, and Sarah breach the tower. Doc topples the antenna, escaping in a pink robe. At the Northern Light listening station, Kaya tracks the man's phone transmission, acquiring his coordinates and Lucy's. They attempt to reach Roberta. Doc steals a bike from a zombie, embarking to reunite with Addie. Meanwhile, the women commemorate Doc's escape with a keepsake from his beard in Sarah's scrapbook. Murphy Town is under attack. The Red Hand has teamed up with Roberta and Sun Mei, and they're gearing up for a significant event at the Museum of Progress. Unbeknownst to them, Kaya from the Northern Light is lending a hand by keeping a close watch on Spokane through full surveillance. Simultaneously, Citizen Z and Kasky are en route to Washington in a small biplane. Tenke, who seems to be blindly following Murphy, gets caught by Roberta. She roughs him up a bit, uncovering his orders from Murphy on a yellow piece of paper, retrieve Warren and deliver her to me. If she refuses, end her life. To test his blend status, Roberta administers the original vaccine to 10K. In a surprising twist, Murphy himself appears. He's dressed like a dictator in a black coat and gloves, sporting newly bleached hair. The remnants of his blue skin form a scar-like pattern around his left eye. He and Roberta clash over their opposing worldviews before Murphy takes 10K back to his hideout, seemingly confident that the group won't breach his fortress. However, he's shaken when the red hand cuts the power and a banner appears on the museum tower, instilling fear in his followers. 10K teams up with Murphy's blend named Auerbach to restore electricity at the Washington Water Power Company. Auerbach is shot by red hand members while attempting to negotiate, and 10K faces a zombie attack. Fortunately, Red and 5K save him. Their escape is cut short as Murphy summons 10K back to the museum. Roberta and Sun may manage to infiltrate the Museum of Progress during the ongoing siege of Murphy Town. Murphy observes the chaos from his throne room, occasionally using mind control to boost his soldiers' confidence. Sun may heads to the lab, and Roberta searches for Murphy. She encounters Hope, who shoots but misses. Roberta kills Hope, leading to a poignant remark about Murphy's feelings. In the lab, Sun May is found by 10K, who's confused. Red and 5K urge him to help Sun May, though he doubts their existence. A kiss from Red dispels any blend influence. 10K assists Sun May, but they're held at gunpoint by Wesson and his men. Finally, the anticipated showdown occurs, Roberta confronts Murphy. She plays on his Z impulses, offering Hope's brains to illustrate his loss of humanity. They fight, with Roberta evading Murphy's attempts to bite her. She points a gun, but Cassidy's arrival stops her. The drama is interrupted by an approaching biplane, Citizen Z. Caskey lands the plane nearby, allowing his passenger to meet Roberta, 10K, and Murphy. Citizen Z relays Doc's message about Lucy's kidnapping. Murphy and Roberta form a truce to plan a rescue mission. Citizen Z wants to join but decides to return to Northern Light upon receiving exciting news. Kaya is pregnant. Addie follows the man, interpreting Lucy's clues. Lucy's location is pinpointed at an old boat yard, where she's accompanied by a group of new zombie friends. Just when it seems Addie and Lucy might escape, the man intervenes, brutally attacking Addie with a gas can. A fierce battle ensues between Addie and the man, occasionally interrupted by zombie attacks spurred by Lucy's cries. The first round goes to the man as he traps Addie on a burning boat. She escapes just before the boat explodes. Fortunately, Lucy has left a severed zombie arm that guides Addie's way, restarting the chase. On the road, Lucy proves to be a nuisance, teasing the man with a morbid song. The man responds by plowing through zombies until Lucy promises silence, creating an oddly cute dynamic. Addie gains the upper hand in the second round, setting an ambush, shooting the man, and commandeering his truck along with him as a hostage. As they drive away, the man reflects on his bulletproof vest's effectiveness. Meanwhile, Doc trails Addie on his bike, finding clues left by her at the boatyard, including the zombie arm pointing the way. Thinking the man might be incapacitated, Addie and Lucy indulge in a shopping spree. Addie's new outfit resembles an action figure, while Lucy learns the practicality of an apocalyptic wardrobe. 
The topic of Lucy's mother triggers a tantrum, during which Addie imparts the harsh reality of death in this world. The man suddenly appears, sparking a chase along the river, leading to another intense battle. Despite a brutal beating and a dislocated shoulder, Addie ultimately loses the third round, with the man escaping with Lucy. Lucy's growth continues as she becomes a teenager, around 15 years old. Craving chocolate, she frustrates the man, who reluctantly sets out to find her a sugary treat. Doc experiences hallucinations involving a DeLorean and himself dressed as Doc Brown alongside 10K as Marty McFly. Addie remarkably recovers, even resetting her dislocated shoulder against a tree. At a general store, the man and Lucy search for chocolate. Lucy bonds with zombies, interpreting their communication and desires. Annoyed with the man's behavior, Lucy leaves through the back, letting him deal with the zombies. Lucy bites a zombie with a grandpa sweater, setting it on a mission. She starts the truck and crashes into the man, who escaped the store, getting her revenge for the zombies he hit earlier. Addie and Lucy briefly reunite, but the man re-emerges from beneath the truck, driving off with Lucy again. Addie encounters a mother and daughter, offering them protection. The girl handles a gun adeptly, fending off a zombie. Addie leaves them reunited. Further ahead, Addie and Doc unite and set off in pursuit of the man. Meanwhile, the zombie with the grandpa sweater continues its solitary journey toward an unknown destination. Lucy has aged once more, appearing about 18 years old. She's exchanged her taunting behavior for a serene calm, which is actually her psychic communication with Grandpa Zombie. He guides Doc and Addie, who are chasing after Lucy and the man. His skeletal finger points the way, repeatedly growling Lucy. Following closely is a rescue team comprised of Roberta, Murphy, Sun Mei, 10K, Red, and 5K. They're en route to Mount Casey, guided by Kaya's surveillance. However, concern grows as Citizen Z hasn't been in contact for 12 hours. 10K's condition has worsened. But Sun Mei is hesitant to administer more medication due to the previous treatments he's received. The man and Lucy reach Mount Casey, where zombies and a Zona SWAT team await. The team obliterates the zombies, revealing their deteriorating immunity through glowing eyes. The man plans to arrange air transportation to Zona for him and Lucy. Doc and Addie arrive, directed by Grandpa Zombie, but they can't access the man's entrance. Grandpa indicates the mountain's peak, urging Addie to climb while Doc waits outside. Despite the perilous ascent, Addie ascends, leaving behind her Z-Whacker. Doc indulges in Z-Weed, but his tranquility is disrupted by more Zona troops. After tying up Doc and Grandpa, the Zona soldiers enter the mountain but soon become zombies themselves. Fortunately, Roberta and the team arrive, dispatching the Zona zombies. Grandpa is destroyed by Roberta, unknowingly eliminating a potential ally. The group enters the mountain, preparing to confront the man. As they progress through the catacombs, 10K collapses, prompting Sun Mei's revelation that they must kill him to save him. Like Murphy in the past, they plan to choke, die, bite, inject 10K. Roberta strangles him, Murphy bites him, and Sun Mei administers the original vaccine. Sun Mei, Red, and 5K stay with 10K while the rest proceed. Roberta, Murphy, and Doc confront the man and Lucy at the mountain's peak. Murphy and Lucy briefly reunite before a shootout ensues. The man's bullet pierces through Murphy and Roberta, who collapse, knocking out Doc. The man grabs Lucy and heads to a Zona aircraft. Patty arrives, having scaled the mountain, and tackles the man, sending both over the edge. Lucy follows, screaming for her Aunt Addie. Subsequently, 5K appears and joins Lucy's leap. An ominous Zona ship opens fire, apparently annihilating Murphy, Roberta, Doc, and those present at the mountain's peak. It's been two years since the season three events took place. The gang's whereabouts are updated. Addie and Lucy fell off a cliff, followed by 5K, Doc, Sun Mei, 10K, and Red. They were pinned down. Murphy got shot, the bullet passing through him into Roberta. Now, Roberta awakens from a coma in an all-white room, dressed in white with blonde hair. Murphy, cured of zombieism and no longer blue, arrives and informs Roberta that she's in Zona. She was comatose for two years, and the team is deceased. Zona, an eerie Stepford paradise filled with white-clad individuals, emerges. Murphy is hailed for his blood donation as the vaccine proved effective eradicating the zombie virus in Zona. However, the outside world is in shambles. Doc and 10K reunite in the woods and head back to Red and 10K's tree tent. Doc urges them to accompany him to New America, a cold Canadian haven free from zombies. Addie, now with an eye patch, remains a vigilante zombie hunter joined by the grown-up in Blue Lucy. In Zona, Murphy takes Roberta to dinner at the Founder's residence. The Founder predicted the zombie apocalypse, gathering the world's wealthiest on Zona. He tested the vaccine on himself and appears a tad eccentric. The founder and elite anticipate the reset, designed to spare the vaccinated and eliminate the unvaccinated and zombies. A flashback unsettles Roberta during a cake-cutting ceremony, leading her to flee. Trapped by water, she struggles to escape Zona. Addie and Lucy are pursued by Zona soldiers and zombies due to Lucy's blood's value. Doc brings Red and 10K to a refugee camp managed by Sun Mei, a stopover en route to New America. 
LT Muller emphasizes human contact and hope. Sun May and Red discuss 5K's fate. With conflicting reports of his disappearance and sacrifice, hostage taking unfolds as Addie and Lucy are kidnapped and confined to a truck. In Zona, Murphy and Roberta sense something amiss. Dr. Teller halts their ambulance, conveying urgent but vague news. A scientist allied with the founder develops a flammable gas to ignite zombies. Roberta's bid for freedom from Zona had an unexpected outcome. She's now with Murphy, both rescued by Dr. Teller. However, Teller is tight-lipped about the situation, focused on evacuating them. Eventually, they halt him, seeking an explanation. Troubling news unfolds. The vaccine is failing, and a grave fate looms over Zona's citizens. The prospect of the once secure haven falling to zombies looms large. Meanwhile, deep in the American woods, Addie and Lucy find themselves captives of the Zona squad. Holed up in a cabin, they're stranded as Doc, 10K, Red, and Sun may gather. LT Muller delivers unsettling news. The anticipated convoy to Numerica is missing, casting doubt and fear. Despite this, 10K and Doc agree to accompany the military group in search of the vanished convoy. A hostile encounter ensues with the kidnappers, revealing an abandoned convoy and a puzzling disappearance of its occupants. Amidst Zona's disintegration, Murphy's eccentric golfing friend presents brutal evidence of the deteriorating situation. Matters worsen. Dr. Teller discloses a grim reality to Murphy and Roberta. The vaccine's failure triggers instant madness and homicidal tendencies in virus-infected individuals. While Murphy and Roberta remain unvaccinated, Dr. Teller succumbed. The firefight continues, forcing Addie and Lucy into opposing roles under threat. Astonishingly, their synchronized gunfire collides mid-air. Yet, a shot to an army member leads to an inexplicable reanimation, a Z. Guided by Dr. Teller, Murphy and Roberta infiltrate the Founder's residence, aiming for escape. The Founder, unhinged, alludes to a hidden truth, hinting at the reset. As violence escalates, Dr. Teller's cryptic advice guides Roberta's visions. A revelation about Murphy's daughter surfaces, leading to a fatal confrontation. Amid the battle with the newsy, Addie is wounded. Lucy vanishes, seized by black-uniformed individuals. Further down the road, Sun May awakens to an empty camp. Doc and 10K's return to the refugee camp echoes the convoy's fate, abundance without occupants. In Zona's final moments, Murphy and Roberta barely board a departing helicopter. Meanwhile, Addie embarks on a new journey, marked by determination. After landing, Murphy and Roberta swiftly reunite with their team and Lucy. The refugee camp near Flagstaff, Arizona becomes their temporary haven as they await their journey to Numerica. Concerns escalate as the other refugees vanish mysteriously. The Z Nation family reconvenes, joined by Doc, eager to proceed but hindered by 10K's search for Red in the woods. Roberta's behavior becomes unsettling as she grapples with recurring nightmares of being set ablaze. LT Muller grows restless, urging a swift departure to Numerica. Meanwhile, 10K navigates the forest, encountering unnerving sounds amidst the presence of snakes and bees. A zombie assault heightens the eerie atmosphere. At the camp, a pervasive sensation of being watched arises, potentially by an invisible entity. The disappearance of camp inhabitants raises suspicion. As LT Muller and Sergeant Lily opt to depart, the team remains behind, awaiting 10K's return. Information circulates swiftly, as Lucy recounts Addie's shooting and Doc realizes the Addie 10K firefight. Amid the chaos, the team discovers Burgess, a refugee in hiding. Burgess provides disturbing details about the camp's invisible, perilous intruder. In the woods, LT Miller confronts an indestructible zombie soldier. Upon 10K's return to camp, distractions allow Burgess to escape. The discovery of a relentless zombie Miller baffles the team. Sergeant Lily emerges and terminates the zombie, revealing her familial connection to him. The team embarks on their journey to Numerica, with Roberta's fixation on an eastward path. Despite uncertainty, Sergeant Lily recognizes Roberta's leadership qualities. Equipped with a new Route 66 shield, Roberta guides her companions towards the east, shaping their destiny. Outside of Topeka, Kansas, the Great Pile, a massive parking lot spanning 200 square miles, becomes the team's location. Warren aims to guide them eastward, though the extent of their journey remains uncertain. Lucy's unique ability to eavesdrop on zombies' thoughts proves challenging. Given the distressing content she encounters, pleas for help from regular zombies and the uncontrollable chaos of Mad Seas. Amidst the turmoil, 10K and Doc engage in a heartfelt conversation about Red. 10K clings to hope for her survival, while grappling with the complexity of their situation. The tranquility is short-lived as rat zombies surface, prompting a swift escape. Yet, the Zona Black Ops team ensnares Lucy in an electrified net. A desperate struggle unfolds as Murphy and Roberta fight to rescue her. In the midst of this chaos, Roberta experiences another cryptic vision of a nightmarish landscape, echoing the guidance of Dr. Teller. A mysterious event unfolds as Murphy's taste of blood triggers an unexpected reaction, raising concerns about his transformation. 
the team faces further threats from Enders, who confiscate their supplies. A new challenge emerges, Warren's unyielding leadership and her focus on her visions. The team confronts her, revealing her visions of a devastated realm where Ashen Rain obliterates all. Despite her insights, the team concludes with a vote, press on eastward or change course to Numerica. The decision is made, Numerica is their destination. During their northward journey, they encounter a zombie laden with ammo and weaponry, a dangerous trap. Sergeant Lily successfully diffuses the explosives, replenishing their ammunition. A confrontation with a mad Z ensues, prompting Warren, armed with her Z Nation Route 66 shield, to sprint towards a beacon, seemingly driven by a memory. Meanwhile, Lucy and Murphy grapple over the fate of a zombie rigged with grenades. Murphy's mercy sparks discord as Lucy rejects his overture, maintaining her distance. Notably, Murphy's troubling attraction to human flesh resurfaces, raising alarms. Radio news reveals Kaya and her child's survival at the Northern Lights listening post, while Citizen Z's fate remains uncertain. While Warren chooses not to join them, the unity of operation by Temark prevails as they collectively move towards the east. Roberta Warren leads the team eastward, tracking the black rainbow she consistently envisions in her nightmarish hellscape. Uncertain of their destination, the gang stumbles upon an abandoned truck, a trap that unleashes a chilling noise, rendering them unconscious. Upon regaining consciousness, the team discovers themselves confined within coffin-like enclosures. Periodically, these boxes are relocated, forcing the team to perform tasks while paired with potentially lethal partners. Tasks like elevator clearance, sharing a single gas mask, and evading danger while combating zombies challenge them. Each task concludes with the jarring noise, returning them to their unconscious state within the boxes. During feeding time, the gang ingeniously uses dog food to craft an escape plan. Despite escaping, they are swiftly ensnared once more. Eventually, Lucy's interaction with a zombie named Carson yields their salvation. Fleeing the noise after their escape prevents further unconsciousness. Running from the bunker, they arrive at the truck that initiated their ordeal. Without comprehending the facility's nature, they resolve to move on swiftly. Murphy's zombie bite raises concern about his transformation. Undeterred, the exhausted yet resolute team continues their eastward journey, prepared for further challenges. With a fresh set of wheels, Warren drives with unyielding determination, perhaps possessed by her mission. Just outside Erie, Indiana, and amid Murphy's deteriorating condition in the backseat, they arrive at Biomod, a scientific facility. Fearing Murphy's transformation, the team rushes him inside to assess his zombie bite. The situation appears grim, prompting Doc and 10K to contemplate ending his suffering. Lucy intervenes with an unconventional idea, biting Murphy to save him. Regrettably, the plan backfires. While Murphy is saved, Lucy's accelerated aging becomes apparent due to her act of salvation through biting. The realization dawns that Lucy's rapid aging is linked to this unusual method. Amidst this discovery, Warren's absence becomes evident. She's delved into the lab's depths, uncovering disturbing sights, zombie parts in petri dishes and notes detailing people's fusion. In her exploration, Warren encounters a locked cabinet. By some instinct, she opens it to reveal a gas canister. Utilizing her acquired knowledge, she disarms the canister. However, the grim nature of the laboratory becomes increasingly apparent. As 10K and Sarge search for Warren, doubts arise about her intentions. After all, she leads them to places that defy comprehension. Eventually, Doc heads out to find them. For Doc, the encounter takes a horrific turn. A zombie finger embeds itself in his abdomen, requiring the intervention of 10K and Sarge to extract it. The trio navigates the facility, encountering a formidable Franken-zombie. Despite their efforts, the battle remains futile until Roberta intervenes, seeking Dr. Edgar Caligari. Caligari attempted a graft that transformed him into the monstrous Franken-zombie. He confirms Roberta's guidance and pleads for mercy, met with a merciful end by the team. Meanwhile, Murphy awakens remarkably improved, grasping the situation. Lucy's multiple bites have saved him, but at the cost of her rapid aging. Returning to Murphy. The team witnesses Lucy's final moments just as they arrive, her sacrifice to save Murphy ultimately leading to her death. After Lucy's tragic demise, a solemn atmosphere engulfs the team. Tensions arise within the group as they acknowledge their reliance on Roberta's instinctive decisions. Arriving near Detroit, Michigan, at the Mystery Hill Carnival, doubts about Roberta's judgment surface. Though she advises against interference, they intervene to rescue a woman ensnared by the carnival's inhabitants, the Zuggalos, zombie-era Juggalos. Despite Roberta's advice to move on, Murphy is resolute in confronting the murderous insane clown posse enthusiasts within the carnival funhouse. Roberta anticipates getting entangled in the ensuing madness, which quickly occurs as they are pulled into terrifying circus games. Amid this chaos, Roberta's visions persist, each death she witnesses in the carnival triggering nightmarish images of the hellscape with the black rainbow. Within the carnival's bizarre setup, Murphy faces a high-voltage contraption, 10K navigates a rotating board with thrown knives, and Doc contends with a face hole barraged by pool balls. Engaging in a unique challenge, Roberta competes in Drink for Your Life, 
answering insane clown posse trivia. Her unexpected expertise catches the attention of the King Zuggalo, leading to a rap battle and an unwelcome engagement, Roberta's reluctant role as the Zuggalo Queen. Amidst a Zuggalo wedding's blood rites and traditional rituals, the arrival of Sergeant Lily and former Queen Janice disrupts the proceedings. Despite Janice's approval of Roberta for her son, a family feud ensues over leadership, involving a zombie patriarch and escalating into a fierce brawl. Amidst the chaos, Murphy harnesses an electrocution machine to convey a stern message about parenthood to the king and his mother, utilizing electric jolts. As the situation deteriorates into juggalo zombies, the team's escape becomes feasible. Roberta admits her uncertainty about their purpose and suggests that since her visions remain enigmatic, the team should proceed directly to Numerica. In the far north, where Citizen Z once sent out signals day and night, Kaya and the Sky, while repairing the Northern Light Station, becomes aware of Zona forces closing in on them. Swiftly, she takes Nana and her infant, Jay-Z, into a panic room, their refuge from danger, desperately trying to summon assistance. Unfortunately, her pleas fall on unresponsive ears. Simultaneously, Operation by Temark, the Valiant team, makes their way to a church close to the Canadian border. Initially seeming like a secure hideout, it proves unexpectedly challenging to escape from. Within the church's upper balcony, Murphy, Doc, 10K, and Sergeant Lily confront a group of zombie nuns, only marking the start of their trials. Zombie hockey players, undead SCTV characters, and numerous other adversaries add to their predicament. Roberta's assertion that their new path could lead them deeper into the fiery nightmare she envisions prompts Murphy to engage in a mental connection. A beautiful field envelops them, but it's fleeting. Soon, Murphy witnesses the fire and ash described by Roberta. As he ignites, he begins to comprehend her anguish, acknowledging his failure to take her concerns as seriously as warranted. As the group continues to seek an escape from the church, they encounter someone ringing a bell within the tower. Unmasking him reveals Lewis, who appears to be gathering artifacts, though suspicion of grave robbing lingers. Through interrogation, they learn of his quest for a relic, St. Teresa's finger bone, reputed to possess healing powers and supposedly buried within the church. Lewis has been drawn here by dreams and visions, amassing artifacts guided by an unseen force. His deep faith resonates with Roberta, suggesting that her visions hold significance. Lewis connects with the entire team, aiding Murphy in processing his emotions following Lucy's demise. Together, they open the crypt. The intrusion of a zombie hockey player into the crypt leads to infection of the priest's body within, reviving him as a zombie. A fierce battle ensues, culminating in the death of the zombie priest. Lewis retrieves an artifact, discovering it's not the correct one. Now trapped in the catacombs, the team understands that a miracle is necessary for their escape. Surprisingly, the sound of bells signals the departure of the zombies. Emerging from the catacombs, they encounter a little girl resembling Lucy, holding the relic Lewis sought. Lewis expresses gratitude and offers tokens of appreciation. In return for their aid, the team receives a battery capable of reactivating their radio, enabling contact with the Northern Light Station. Despite a signal from Kaya in the sky, communication remains unidirectional, listening to her without the ability to respond. This prompts them to return to the U.S., pursuing a transmitter and altering their trajectory away from Numerica. Operation by Temark navigates to Green Bay, Wisconsin, in search of a transmitter to establish contact with Kaya at the Northern Light Station. The ideal location for this purpose is the Channel 9 Action News Station. Flashbacks shed light on the station's fate during the zombie apocalypse, centering on Carly McFadden, who gains prominence as a news anchor alongside the confrontational Jack Kingman, consistently undermining her efforts. In the present, the team discovers gasoline capable of fueling a generator in the station, which has remained sealed since the outbreak. The Action 9 news team, now transformed into zombies, roams the station, echoing the outcome. Returning to the past, the news team confronts the onset of the zombie apocalypse near the station, arising from a plane crash site. Initial awareness is lacking, but they're soon faced with the grim reality. The news team's decision to broadcast Mike Renfro, now a zombie, leads to chaos as he attacks colleagues and turns them into zombies. Kingman, also affected, assaults Murphy, Doc, and 10K in the present timeline before being granted mercy. In the Northern Light Station, Citizen Z informs Kaya and Nana about his plane crash, resulting in Uncle Kasky's death and his reunion with his son, Jay-Z. He discovers the heightened intelligence and agility of the new breed of zombies which are impervious to conventional methods of elimination. Investigating the station's occupants, he encounters Mr. Sunshine from Zona, seemingly tied to the enigmatic plan pursued by Zona's eerie scientist. Back in Milwaukee, Operation by Temark ascends the new station's rooftop in pursuit of transmitters for communication with the Northern Light Station, evading the relentless pursuit of zombies. A flashback reveals Carly's own rooftop ascent, pursued by zombies. As the team reaches the roof, Carly McFadden's fate comes to light. She remained there, reporting while awaiting News Chopper 9 for rescue. Tragically, the chopper crashed near the station, leaving Carly to die and reanimate in solitude. 
In the present, reanimated Carly attacks the team, meeting her end through Roberta Warren's mercy. In the station's control room, Kaya confronts the enigmatic Zona individual transmitting information. Though she attempts to intervene, she rushes off to assist Citizen Z. The significance of his pursuit becomes clear, uncovering information stored on discs labeled Black Rainbow. Reconnecting with Operation by Temark sparks excitement, and the revelation that the Black Rainbow is present on the discs reinforces Roberta's conviction, they are on the correct path. Zona's quest aligns with the Black Rainbow depicted in her visions. Operation by Temark arrives in Chicago and witnesses its grim condition. For years, a deadly mix of industrial chemicals, radioactive fallout, and decomposing bodies in Lake Michigan have disrupted the natural balance, now compounded by a storm that cloaks the city in a thick green foam form from this blend. Seeking respite, Doc and Murphy enter a barber shop, only to encounter a blast from the past, Sketchy and Skeezy are also present in Chicago. Although the barber proposes a shave and haircut, Doc becomes suspicious. Conversely, Murphy embraces the offer. Sketchy and Skeezy appear to be warning Murphy and Doc about something sinister, and it becomes evident that the barber harbors harmful intentions. Furthermore, an armed assailant resides upstairs, while zombies lurk in the basement, unveiling an elaborate trap. In due course, Doc identifies the barber as Sal, a con man from his pre-apocalypse days. Sal and the upstairs gunman, Tiny, coerce Doc, Murphy, Sketchy, and Skeezy at gunpoint, exploiting their vulnerability. Eventually, 10K and Sarge arrive for support, yet even the formidable team falls victim to robbery. Amidst misadventures, including an unnaturally tan zombie and an attempt at democratic decision-making, suspicions arise concerning Sketchy and Skeezy's intentions. New adversaries emerge, victims of Sketchy and Skeezy's previous swindle, deceived by their impersonation of Murphy. Amidst last-minute efforts to spare Skeezy's life, Sal expels him into the toxic foam. The gang orchestrates a ploy, luring the antagonists into a basement infested with zombies. The newcomers meet a grisly end, consumed by the zombies, though Sal and Tiny manage to eliminate the threats. As Sal prepares to execute Doc, Murphy, and Sketchy, Skeezy intervenes by using an RPG to blast open the front door, impaling Sal and Tiny. Simultaneously, Roberta Warren navigates the green foam, pursuing an elusive figure who might be fleeing or beckoning her. Upon unmasking the figure, she recognizes the deceased Harold Teller. Teller imparts a cryptic message about her pivotal role before vanishing. As the foam recedes, Operation by Temark reunites, departing from Chicago. Sketchy and Skeezy seize control of the barber shop, dubbed Curl Up and Die, and hatch plans to eliminate their competitors. Following Roberta Warren's lead has become a routine for the team, despite the myriad escapades it's led them into. However, even she is uncertain of their current destination. Departing Chicago The members of Operation by Temark trek across Illinois, ultimately arriving at a familiar site, a factory outside Springfield, Illinois. This is where a monumental clash unfolded between them and the man over Dr. Harold Teller's possession. For 10K, the factory evokes poignant memories, as it's where he encountered Red and taught 5K to wield a slingshot. Doc attempts to provide solace. But 10K, maintaining his stoic demeanor, enters the laboratory, trailing behind Roberta. Inquiring about the contents within, Roberta's response is laden with uncertainty, she's determined to uncover answers deep within the factory. Her quest is driven by the aspiration to unravel the Black Rainbow Scheme and halt its progress. The pursuit of answers continues, guided by her persistent dreams. The lab holds haunting recollections. Within its confines, Murphy was able to hear Dr. Teller's partially zombified wife due to his half-zombie state. These partial zombies, including Dr. Teller's wife, raised inquiries about their son. Presently, they discover that Dr. Teller had confined their son, Andrew, within a life-supporting glass chamber. Murphy empathizes with this choice, acknowledging his willingness to preserve Lucy's existence in a suspended state. In the meantime, Roberta and 10K venture in pursuit of the insights conveyed by Roberta's dreams. Staying attuned to the dream's guidance, she navigates the labyrinthine lab, seeking the canisters she seeks. Eventually, as the dream falters, she enlists 10K's aid, requesting him to provoke her vision-triggering punch. Overcoming the difficulty, the punch ultimately aids her in acquiring another gas canister. Simultaneously, at the Northern Light Station, Kaya and Citizen Z grapple with a zombie named Scampy that CZ inadvertently brought back with him. They vanquish Scampy by confining him within a body bag and pummeling him with weapons. After overcoming this obstacle, they embark on a quest for information about Black Rainbow, exploring the facility's records. They uncover that Black Rainbow was a U.S. government fourth-strike weapon. Sarge manages to bolster the radio's power, enabling communication with Citizen Z and Kaya, albeit intermittently. In a weighty decision, Roberta diverts power from Andrew's life support to the radio to establish contact. When Sarge is unable to take this step, Roberta assumes the responsibility, granting Andrew mercy. Both teams piece together a troubling revelation. Their adversary is a fourth-strike weapon designed to eradicate all life on Earth. This implies that, despite the ongoing zombie apocalypse, 
Another cataclysmic event looms, one that aims to eliminate all life, both human and undead. Black Rainbow embodies the reset concept pursued by Zona. To thwart the Black Rainbow plan, the team must journey to the launch site and deactivate it using the President's thumbprint. Thus, they embark on their mission to locate the President's thumbprint. In their pursuit of the President's thumbprint, the team sets course for Mount Weather, Virginia, a clandestine subterranean refuge where the government sought shelter during the apocalypse. Approaching a vehicle marked with the presidential seal, they discover that the individual they initially assumed to be the president has fallen victim to his own zombified secret service detail. Regrettably, there's no thumbprint or even a complete hand to be found. Unexpectedly, the deceased individual turns out to be the president's husband. Venturing into the underground bunker, the gang confronts the remnants of the zombified Congress. Ultimately, they encounter the president, cognizant of her husband's demise, flanked by two surviving secret service agents both bearing the name Agent Johnson. However, the present president lacks thumbs due to an incident orchestrated by Mr. Sunshine from Zona, who incapacitated the Secret Service agents and removed her thumbs. They require the thumbs of the president from the outset of the apocalypse, Bill Carney, now a zombie located 25 levels below. Before embarking on the quest to find the president, the gang is presented with a video detailing Black Rainbow, a Cold War-era fourth-strike weapon designed to deploy flesh-eating bacteria and eradicate all life to safeguard U.S. interests, even in the absence of the United States as an entity. Descending to the bunker's 25th floor, they encounter the zombified West Wing staff and even the cast of Hamilton. Employing their customary strategic approach, the gang devises a plan, luring the zombies into a vacant room to eliminate them individually until they identify the target. However, their plan is disrupted when Warren goes missing. She ventures deeper into the zombie-infested bunker, locating the required president in a press briefing room, where a teleprompter asserts that the zombie virus is contained. With the zombie president in their custody, the gang readies themselves for the journey to Washington, D.C. During this moment, Warren mentions their intention to thwart Black Rainbow. Unexpectedly, the sitting president turns hostile and the Secret Service agents draw their firearms. As the commander-in-chief, the president orders Sarge to cooperate with Agents Johnson in apprehending Operation by Temark. Sarge grapples with a difficult choice, torn between her attachment to the team and her marine oath to obey her commander-in-chief. Ultimately, the gang learns of the president's steadfast determination to execute the reset. Her destination is Zona, with Sarge compelled to accompany her. However, at a critical juncture, Sarge realizes the president's directives are unequivocally unjust and therefore illegal. She eliminates the president as the Secret Service agents turn on each other. While Tenke and Sarge neutralize the zombified Secret Service agents, Warren dispatches the zombie version of the president, subsequently experiencing a vision of the Black Rainbow. Armed with newfound direction, she discerns their next destination, Washington, D.C. Having reached Washington, D.C., the ultimate destination, Operation by Temark embarks on their final endeavor. Roberta Warren's objective is to infiltrate the covert bunker harboring the enigmatic fourth strike weapon known as Black Rainbow. Employing a tactic reminiscent of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the team gains access to the bunker while accompanied by the zombified president. Their sole mission is to locate the control room for the Black Rainbow a weapon capable of eradicating all life on Earth, and utilize the president's zombified thumbprints to deactivate it. Upon entry, they find themselves surrounded by zombies that were specifically trained for one purpose, extermination. A prominent sign reinforces this notion. Among the occupants of the bunker is Mr. Sunshine from Zona, who has traversed various regions of North America and even crossed paths with Citizen Z. A flashback unveils the origins of Roberta's visions. During her coma, Dr. Harold Teller awakened her and provided her with comprehensive training to combat the zombie apocalypse. Dr. Teller has developed a cure, and the visions that have plagued her consciousness were part of her training. The knowledge of canisters and their strategic placement within the drone was implanted in her subconscious by Dr. Teller. These canisters constitute a remedy for the bacterial threat within the drone. In the flashback, Dr. Teller reveals the canisters to Warren. Her long-standing collection and visualization of these canisters culminate in this moment, as the time arrives to load them into the drone for their journey to deliver a cure to all. Equipped with the necessary understanding, Warren instructs Murphy and Doc to initiate the drone upon her signal. She bids a heartfelt farewell to the team, having always anticipated this to be an irreversible expedition. Proceeding to the hangar, Warren effortlessly defeats Mr. Sunshine, who was in the process of loading canisters into the drone. She then substitutes the canisters in the drone with her own. Adhering to Warren's instructions, the team follows the countdown initiation. However, an ominous sensation permeates the air. As Warren extricates herself from the drone, Mr. Sunshine assaults her, triggering yet another flashback. This prompts Roberta to recall a harsh truth. Contrary to Dr. Teller's assertions that she held the solution to humanity's plight, her training was actually intended to render her capable of delivering the reset. The Black Rainbow, 
a calamitous event that would obliterate all life, paving the way for Zona's colonization of the remnants. The revelation dawns that Warren herself was the harbinger of the reset all along. Amidst a confrontation between Murphy and Mr. Sunshine, a canister accidentally ruptures, showering both individuals with its contents. Observing from the sidelines, the team witnesses Warren struggle within the drone as she endeavors to detach the canisters. However, she only manages to remove one, leaving the drone partly laden with flesh-eating bacteria. The drone ascends into the sky, in a mesmerizing display reminiscent of Warren's visions. The drone disperses a multitude of miniature drones that fan out in an arc. As Doc and a rejuvenated Murphy witness the drone's dispersion, Sarge and Tenke seize the moment for intimacy on the hangar floor. Meanwhile, Warren finds herself trapped in the drone, which gradually loses altitude and hurtles towards a mountainside. 